Um, yeah, okay, so so the notes uh, are quite thick because I put in more information. At the same time, uh, yeah, so you don't have to copy so much. I think the other classes, uh, they have a lot of bullet points, but then the elaboration, I think the uh, professor or lecturer asked them to check the um, uh, the study guide. So so how I like it to do it is like, I like more information in the slide, so you don't have to keep on referring, right? And then you don't know which is important, which is not. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> our slides are better. So um, you have a comparative advantage. <laughs> uh, so usually, you know, you know, usually if you have a competitive advantage, companies, when companies have a competitive advantage, they uh, tend not to share the, the, the secret, but that's for companies. So share, I mean, sharing is good, so you should share as well. I'm just saying. Okay, so let's start. Um, I think we are three minutes over. Okay, so today we have two key parts. We'll first talk about um, the modern portfolio theory, all right? Uh, and then we'll talk about asset allocation. So there are two separate uh, parts of the lecture, but then at the end of the day, we need to use this modern portfolio theory to do the asset allocation. And um, maybe even before, before I start, right? Um, generally speaking, the the I like to give like the, the uh, bird's eye view concept. So at the end of the day, right, when you talk about asset allocation, there's a lot of details about how you go uh, locate asset, et cetera. But at the end of the day, right, what you're trying to do is you're trying to diversify. So that's the most important part, diversification. And there are many uh, concepts or, or methods on how you're going to diversify, how you're going to do it, and, and a lot of details, right? Now, even this pop, modern popular theory, they have a lot of details on diversification, but the, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to diversify. We are trying to reduce. Um, if you uh, watch the recorded lecture, we are trying what we are trying to reduce is we, we are trying to reduce unsystematic risk. And we and for systematic risk the, or beta risk, there are risks that um, we have to assume in the portfolio. Of course, later we'll talk about how we're going to remove the systematic risk, but that's for the next lecture. But at the moment, what we are uh, trying to understand is we are just trying to diversify. Uh, we are trying to remove all the unsystematic risks, and what remains is the uh, systematic component only. All right, uh, and the systematic component is the beta risk. Um, and so there are various methods, uh, and then we need some assumptions as well in the market, like efficient market hypothesis, uh, which I hope you still remember in uh, year one. Um, and then we need to. Then we tackle a few questions like cap M model, which we'll talk about in, uh, in a bit. All right. Okay, so I hope you have looked through the lecture 2A. Now let's start with a modern portfolio theory. All right. So um when we think about risk, I always like to highlight that risk should be thought of as the standard deviation. Okay, so not variance. And the reason why is that. Um, yes, you need a the, you need to calculate the variance of the portfolio, variance of the assets. But why we cannot use variance is that variance is a square. So what what happens is that if you are using percentage, right? If you are using percentage to calculate returns, you can't re percentage square. And when it's a square, you cannot compare it. So remember, total risk is always measured in standard deviation. All right, and so. Uh, I'm just going to touch a little on the record lecture in case some of y'all might not have the time and might want to look through it over the weekends. So total risk is standard deviation. Systematic risk is beta risk, right? And the unsystematic component is the component that should be diversified away. If you don't diversify the risk away, you will not be rewarded for taking unsystematic risk, All right? So having this concept in mind, we know that when we form a portfolio, there are portfolios that are better than others, right? Which is why we have this concept. Let me just pull up my pen, um, which is why we have this concept. Uh, let, me, let me save a copy. Let me save a copy. Okay. Okay, which is why we have this concept called um, efficient frontier. So basically, it means that what, which portfolio or which combinations of portfolio is the most efficient, which means it gives the, um, the highest uh, returns, right, for the level of 
systematic risk you're taking. Remember when we talk about portfolio, we are already diversifying all your systematic component. Right? So we are not, not um, we don't really care about the unsystematic component. Okay. So um, so this is the efficient portfolio. But um, what I'd like to show you is, okay, this. So we have different portfolio weights, right? So now we are only doing two, two assets. Two assets meaning um, two stocks. So Intel stock and Coca-Cola stock. Obviously, you know that when we do a portfolio, it's for sure more than two stocks. When you do a portfolio, um, if you look at the uh, recap for lecture 2A, it says that it needs at least 40 stocks, right? To have uh, to diversify all your systematic components. So in this case, we only tackle two stocks first because the concept is the same and gets um, mathematically quite complex if you do um, too many stocks and we need a computer to do it. So we can't do it by hand, all right? So now you just think about two stocks first because it's the same concept. So when we have two stocks, we can um, kind of combine the stocks in different... Uh, uh, oh, we can't find this. It is in the... Is in the uh, blackboard. Could everyone find the stock? Okay, okay, sorry. Could everyone find the slides? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's under the module. Uh, try go ahead, try to go to the uh tutorial group. So it's group four, group zero four one. Uh, the slides are that's called lecture two, and in the blackboard there is um the recording which is 2a and then there's a slide which is lecture two i also posted lecture two right um oh okay so the slides right the slides the lecture two set of slides contains lecture 2a and lecture 2b slides so um so let me just so these lecture so these are all the all the things that i explained in the recording so they are in the same set of slides yeah so this is just the continuation uh, if you go to slide 44 out of 135, you will see where we are talking about. All right. Okay, so I'll continue. Um, if you have more issues, maybe... Uh, yeah, okay, great, great. You found it. Okay, perfect. All right, so we are talking about different weights of the portfolio, right? And different weights of portfolio can affect the kind of returns you get based on the risk level. So... Uh, the weights become very important. So what we are trying to do now is let's say we do different weights as shown here, and then we calculate what's expected return and we calculate what's the volatility and all this we, you should be able to, or you should know how to calculate, all right? Um, and then what we do is we plot this thing, okay? So this graph looks a bit complex, but don't worry. Just take one step at a time. So look at expected return. So this is the y-axis expected return, the volatility, measured by standard deviation or the total risk is measured uh, on the x-axis. So what we are doing here now is we plot the portfolio here based on the weights, based on the weights here, we given here 1, 0, 80%, 20%, etc. So we are plotting the, um, the weights here. And what do we notice? That uh, empirically, or like when we keep on doing this for various portfolios, we notice that the kind of shape the graph is, is we call it a parabola, meaning like a, like a curve like this, right? So this becomes the shape of the, um, the portfolio. And this shape here, right, is called the frontier. Why is it the frontier? So, what happens is that now this is a portfolio of Intel and Coca-Cola, right? The, it can be uh, three stocks, maybe Intel, Coca-Cola, and Amazon, right? So the thing is the portfolio, where you add more and more stocks, the frontier will keep on moving here like this until you have diversified all your unsystematic risks. Then it will just stop. And so this will be the frontier. So there are many, many... So the area under here is all the is all the various type of combinations in order combination of portfolio and all and the 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 tip of these combinations here is the frontier. That's why it's called frontier. Okay. So this is the efficient. Uh, so this is the frontier 
of the portfolio. Uh, and because we are targeting only two stocks, so you just look at this, this front here, here. And what we notice is what? The portion in red here, this is the efficient portfolio. Why? Because can you see the volatility versus expected returns? Can you see that the returns increase as the volatility and the as the sorry as the expected return increase, the volatility decrease. So this portion here is the efficient portfolio, uh, efficient portfolios. But what here, right? You notice that it's inefficient because can you see the expected return decrease. And the volatility decrease, right? At the end of the day, you want higher returns and less risk. So which portion should we look at? We should look at efficient portfolio, which is here. All right. So immediately from the graph, we know that the combination of assets supposed should be at least um, here is 20% Coca-Cola and 80% Intel. Uh, yeah. Let me just see again. Uh, one is Intel. So 8%, so at least 80% Intel, 20% Coca-Cola, or 20% Intel, 80% Coca-Cola. So this portion here is the efficient portion. All right. Anyone has issues with this graph? Um, because we'll see variations of this graph. So this is the most basic form of um, this so-called uh, efficient frontier. Okay, we are, we are good. Remember, uh, any questions? Questions to stop me. Okay, so now let's think a little more about this graph, right? So we have seen this. Now, uh, in lecture 2A, we talked about correlation. And I, I believe this is not a new concept as well, because we covered this in year one. Um, and so what happens is that why did it give this shape here, right? Like a parabola, because of the correlation. So there are various different kind of correlation. You know, the best correlation is. Is it one or negative one? Anyone? What's the best correlation? In terms of diversification, is it plus one or negative one? Okay, most people are saying, okay, there's a mix. Huh? Okay, so, so um, uh, I'll, I'll encourage you all to watch the lecture 2A. So the best correlation is negative one, uh, not plus one, because you want stocks to be uncorrelated so that they will diversify each other. All right. So please take note that the best correlation is negative one. Okay. Another way to think about it is look, let's look at the graph here. Okay. So there is plus one here and minus one. Okay, let's look at plus one first, the most easy, uh, as in the easier to understand graph. So the plus one graph, right, is like this. So what does it mean? Can you see that the, the volatility, okay, let's say for, let's look at one expected return. Uh, let's say we look at 10, um, maybe 15% here. Okay, for 15% 15, 15 return, do you notice that when you are a neg at a negative one portion, negative one correlation, can you see that the volatility is so low compared to a plus one? So at plus one, your standard deviation is, 40%, but at, if your correlation is negative, it becomes what, around 8%. So remember standard division is the risk, right? So at, if you don't get 15% return, which one will you prefer? A risk of 8% or a risk of, let's say 38%. Which one is better? If let's say you, are, you want a 15% return. 8%, right? Everyone can see 8%, correct. So 8%, so at 8%, the, co the correlation is negative one, which is why the negative correlation is the best. Because basically what happens is negative correlation means that you have two different stocks. So one stock is Intel is a tech stock and Coca-Cola is a um, uh, domestic goods stock. So they move in different direction and therefore they diversify each other. And the correlation is uh, uh, negative, all right? Okay, so once we understand this idea of correlation, we know that as uh, uh, a correlation of plus one is a straight line like this, as the correlation decreases to negative, it keeps on stretching the parabola to like this. And remember what I mentioned earlier, that as you go towards here, the better it becomes, right? Because 
it means what you are get for that level of return, you are getting lesser and lesser risk. All right, so lesser and lesser risk here. So that's why as it stretches northwards, if you refer back to the first slide, they say the northward portfolio is the best. What so what's north? So you are actually going here. That means like towards the um towards closer towards the y-axis. So it gets better and better. All right. So that's why we, we see this very interesting graph that goes like this. Now, then you say that, wow, the negative one correlation, can you see that the graph is so funny? It's like a, almost like a triangle. Yeah, so this is an extreme case of um, uh, diversification where if you notice, we're at 10%, it will go, the, the volatility becomes very low. Like, 10% expected return, your volatility is only 10%. So that's why it's like a, a fine triangle. Okay. How come the correlation? Oh no, the correlation doesn't change. So this is not about saying about correlation changing. This is giving the example, if the correlation is, let's say, plus one, if the correlation is plus 0 0.3, if the correlation is 0 point, uh, negative 0 0.3. So the correlation, correlation between stocks cannot change. Um, if it's the same kind of stocks, unless the market conditions change. But this is just an example of um, different correlation, how it actually affects the graph. Okay. Uh, what does P mean? Oh, no, P, this is not P, this is a uh, row. So row is correlation, right? Um, so uh, yeah, this is a row, it means correlation. Okay. So remember, correlation or row is between plus one and negative one. So correlation cannot be two or three or four or five, okay? It's only between plus one and negative one. All right. So this is just showing different types of correlation, how it changes. So if you are asked, okay, you'll never be asked to plot a graph, but how you actually remember this is like, oh, correlation of plus one is a straight line. And then as it gets more and more negative, it bends, you keep on bending until the extreme correlation, which is the best kind of correlation negative one, is when it's like almost like a triangle like this. So in real life, it's very hard to find a stock that is negatively correlated, which is negative one. It's very hard to find a stock. Most of the time it's like 0 0.8, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's very good really. All right. Okay, so um, if you look through the review lecture, we'll, you will see this formula and I explain it uh, quite in detail uh, using even Excel example. So um, this is just the idea of when the correlation is negative one, you, you plug the um, values, all these values inside this equation in order to calculate the portfolio um, variance or standard deviation, because this is square root, so it's standard deviation. Then you notice that when it's negative one, it basically goes in opposite direction. The correlation is directly opposite each other and hence um, the risk is zero here, right? But this is a very extreme case, right? You, most of the time you never see uh, negative one. So basically this calculation is just to show you that how you actually get a zero, uh, zero risk, which is where it's perfectly negatively correlated, all right? So I, I repeat again, uh, the review lecture is very important. Uh, uh, lecture 2A is very important uh, uh, to look through. Uh, I believe some of the concepts might be even, even tested in uh, your TMA. Can correlation field be different from... Okay, so correlation can is between negative one and plus one. It can be any number. So it can be uh, 0 0.52 or, or any number, but it cannot exceed... Uh, negative one or plus one. So if you calculate correlation and in the uh, lecture 2A, I explained how you calculate correlation um, using Excel. Then after calculating correlation, if you get a uh, 1.2, you know that something is wrong with your, your calculation. So you need to review it. Okay, It's always between negative one and plus one. All right. So um, now, remember just now, I mentioned the efficient portfolio is the one that is extreme on, on, the, on the edge of all the different type of portfolio. Now, that example, okay, I, I stepped a little forward, but the example was actually two stocks, right? Now, if you add more and more stocks, I mentioned that usually portfolio is 40 stocks is the best because you remove all the unsystematic risks. And so when you... Uh, I'm just, I'll go back to here. But when you add 
all the various stocks, right? You keep on adding stocks, the frontier keep on moving here, keep on moving northwards as you add more and more stocks inside your portfolio. And of course, after 40 stocks, it will kind of stop. All right. So what is the mini? There's this concept called the oh sorry, the um minimum variance frontier. Basically, is the set of portfolio of let's say 40 stocks, let's just assume it's 40 stocks, that gives you the minimum variance and for the same level of um, the same level of uh, uh, returns. So this this idea of the minimum variance. So it's the variance at least. All right. So I'll I'll go to this example. So this example here is uh, three uh, no, four stocks and then it's ten stocks. Can you see that? Okay, between the three stocks and ten stocks, if you are only comparing ten and three, this is the minimum variance from here because. If the max can go is 10 stocks, then this is the minimum variance already, right? So how you imagine it again, remember, just go to, let's say, 5% here. You can you see that for the, the, the colorful line, at 5%, your risk is so much lower compared to if you have just four stocks, your risk is so much higher, all right? So which is the minimum variance? So, so this graph, right, is basically called the modern portfolio theory. And um, if you're very interested in this, uh, or let's say you do a master's in the future, um, you should be able to, you should understand that this is called the uh, Markowitz uh, frontier. Okay, so if someone says this, what's Markowitz? Um, so this is the efficient frontier. It's, uh, it's created by this researcher called Markowitz, okay? In case uh, someone say Markowitz says like, oh, I never heard of it, but actually you, now, now you have. It's this, this, thing, this thing called uh, efficient frontier. All right. Okay, so just now we have always talked about two stocks, right? Uh, Intel and Coca-Cola. And both of these stocks are uh, risky stocks. Now, we know that we can add risk-free stocks. And um, again, I'll repeat that risk-free stocks are things that you can consider like um, a fixed deposit is risk-free. Uh, maybe you buy a government bond, it's risk-free. So these are risk-free assets. So we can actually add risk-free stocks inside. So, But we want to understand how does it impact your efficient frontier? Okay, so first there is a calculation part, but we're, what's uh, more intuitive is that we look at the graph. Okay, but let's think about the calculations first. Okay, so we know that risk-free um, Risk-free assets, okay, this is very important. Uh, as I mentioned in the uh, 2A lecture, risk-free assets, beta is always zero, okay? So um, a question, let's say in the exam, or TMA or whatever, if they say a risk-free asset, you need to immediately know that the beta is zero. They won't say beta is zero for you because it's assumed that it's zero, all right? So important to take note of. Um, why beta zero means that there is no systematic risk, it does not move against uh, the risky portfolio. So there's no risk at all, because risk-free, right? Okay, so uh, highlighted here is always zero, it's important. So we have our, um, we know how to calculate the expected returns. Uh, I mentioned again, uh, it's explained in uh, lecture 2A. So we need to use the weight times the return, right? And we know that if we are use, adding a risk-free, we, are, we need to multiply by RF, okay? So W is the, uh, let W be the weight of, uh, weight of uh, percentage of uh, risky asset, which is why it's here, risky asset. And then one minus W, W is basically the remaining weight that you put in the risk-free asset. So that's why it's one minus W here, okay? So then you work out this, um, then you work out, you multiply it and you work out this portion here, you deduce it to this format. You basically just multiply in and then you shift all the W to one to this side so you get this. Okay. And then now we calculate the standard deviation of portfolio. Again, I'm, uh, I want to repeat that the calculation was covered in how to calculate was covered in lecture 2A. And so we know that for risky, oh sorry, risk-free asset, the standard deviation is zero. And then we need to we know that we need to consider the covariance or correlation, depending on which one you want to use. And the correlation between um, a risky and a risk-free asset is zero, right? Because if you plug in the formula, we know that correlation, you need to add in the standard deviation of the risk-free asset, Rf, 
So the standard deviation of the risk-free asset here is zero. So the whole thing becomes zero. So that's why you have two zeros here. Okay, so what's interesting now? Um, this is a very important concept uh, that you have to try to understand is that, can you see that when you add in the risk-free asset into your portfolio, you notice something that the standard deviation decrease. Why? Because now you're just, the standard deviation of the, or, uh, of, of the original portfolio without the risk-free asset, compared to the standard deviation of the portfolio with a risk-free asset, which with a risk-free asset here, can you see that it's just, you, you need to multiply by a W. And W, remember, is what? 0.8 or 80%, or it can be 0.5, which is 50%. So 50% risk-free, 50% risky. So what happens? When you add a risk-free asset inside your portfolio, your overall risk of the portfolio decreases by the weight that you, that, that you have for the risky asset or the risk-free asset, right? So this is quite cool, right? You add in the risk-free asset, then your overall risk of the portfolio decrease. So this are, so it's only a fraction of the volatility of the risky asset. Can everyone understand this? Any, anyone has questions? But this is a very basic concept um, which we will build on later as we get more and more complex. Yeah, correct. So, so imagine you, if you only have a portfolio of risky asset and then you add in the treasury bonds inside, then the overall portfolio of the, uh, let's say, risky asset with the treasury bonds, the overall um, risk will decrease, which is only a fraction. That's why it's only a fraction. All right. Oh yeah. Also, I encourage you, if you, if you find it very difficult to type, you can just unmute yourself anytime. All right. Yeah. So it's only a fraction, which is, the beauty of these construction portfolios, which is why I guess you learn portfolio, all right? Okay, so um, we are going to use a bit of uh, algebra to manipulate. Don't worry, these are just arithmetic. Uh, you will never be tested on like, oh, I want you to prove this sharp ratio, how you prove it, you never be tested on that, but you just need to understand the concepts, okay? Um, so we have this equation, which from the last slide, and then we have this one, right? from the last slide as well. We know that the SD apostrophe, so this SD apostrophe means that the portfolio uh, with the risk-free asset uh, is equals to the weight times the uh, standard deviation um, of the portfolio without the risky uh, risk-free asset. So this is the original portfolio, all right? So now we want to equate it to W. So W becomes the standard deviation of the portfolio with the risk-free asset divided by a standard deviation of portfolio without the risk-free uh, risk asset, okay? So I'm just going to write here, with W, uh, with RF. So this with risk-free asset, this one is without RF, okay? And so what happens is that I'm going to plug in W inside this equation here to get, get you this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift the SD portfolio. So without the apostrophe, SD portfolio underneath this term here, okay? Which is what ha what's happening here. Then multiply by SD apostrophe portfolio. So it's, I'm just shifting a little. Um, and what happens is that if you remember um, your year one, we learn this thing called sharp ratio or risk and reward ratio. What happens is that we actually get this beautiful ratio here called the sharp ratio. All right. Okay, I think we have a question. I want to clarify this uh, since you did mention a couple of times last week. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is a year three mod. So I'm quite surprised that you are taking year one. Um, basically, you need to have taken the financial management module in year one. All right. Uh, and I think it's a compulsory module that everyone's supposed to take. Uh, yeah. So I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry. I saw it's a direct message. But okay. Um, so a, a friend of uh, a classmate of yours mentioned that um, uh, 
uh, your classmate is actually year one taking this module. Okay, so this is a year three module. So you need to have concepts that was covered in the year one mods. All right. Uh, so maybe you want to revise, we'll see whether you want to continue taking this mod. Um, okay, so uh, moving on. Oh, <laughs> year one, year three. Okay, I guess you, you can do that. Um, maybe you need to study a bit on uh, by yourself. If you want, uh, I can send you the year one mod, um, the one that I'm referring to financial management. I have the set of slides I can share, uh, share with you uh, if you want, you can just drop me an email, okay? Because I also teach that um, and yeah, I'm quite familiar with the content that's covered, which is why I know all these are being covered in year one. Okay, okay. so we talk about sharp ratio here, which is the risk and reward ratio. And I um, this might be a concept that might have been skipped in uh, by a professor teaching the financial uh, management mod, but usually I don't skip it because uh, I feel it's important, is that what do you notice here? Okay, do you notice something? Y equals to MX plus C. And, and anyone can say, remember what is Y equals MX plus C? Anyone? What was this uh, equation of a line? Perfect equation of line. That's what I want to hear, want to hear. So when you see Y equals MX plus C, can you compare this with this um, eventual form that we get here? E R P equals to R F plus this thing times S D of a prosopy portfolio. Can you see that immediately this sharp ratio is the gradient, right? Is M. Your R F is C, and S D here is your X lah, basically, right? So why is this important? Because we're going to plot this on a graph. And by knowing why it goes MX plus C, you immediately know what is the gradient. So the gradient is actually the sharp ratio. And again, I repeat, sharp ratio measures the risk, uh, reward and volatility or risk and reward ratio, right? So what we want for a portfolio is that we want the sharp ratio to be as high as possible, right? Because we want to have higher rewards, right? For uh, lower volatility. So then basically SD here is small right is if it's small and you want this one to be big and so the overall sharp ratio will be big so big is better so you want a big sharp ratio okay and what does this mean a straight line okay we'll look at the graph to understand what does this means so remember i say sharp ratio is the gradient right now and the y intercept um c is the RF, right? Uh, I'm just quickly going to flip over because it's important concept. So your RF here is your C, right? We mentioned it because of Y plus MX plus C. All right. So if we're going to plot the line, this um the line that we saw that the equation of the line, we know that risk free here is your C. Okay. And what is your sharp ratio? So your uh, uh sorry not sharp uh yeah your sharp ratio is your basically your gradient the type of gradient right so it can be this line here it can be this line it can be any line it can be any line I want here now but what as a portfolio manager what am I interested in I want a sharp ratio that is as big as possible but of course infinity is not the we can't have infinity right <laughs> yeah we can't have the highest so what is the best portfolio can you see that is this portfolio that is the highest and the highest gradient. Can you see the gradient is the highest and it touches the efficient frontier. Okay, why is this important? Because it shows that, first of all, we need to touch efficient frontier because remember the efficient frontier or this parabola thing that I was talking about is the, is the risk and reward of holding Remember, only risky assets, right? But now we have to consider uh, risk-free assets. And when we consider risk-free assets, risk-free asset is a straight line. So what happens is that at the end of the day, your best or most efficient portfolio becomes a straight line. It's no longer a parabola because we need to consider risk-free investments, all right? And then maybe you want to think about it. Why don't you consider risk-free investments? Because we just now calculated that if we include risk-free investments, our overall SD or overall risk decreased by the weight of the risk-free investments we had, right? Remember W? 
So we want to consider risk-free investments and hence the efficient portfolio becomes a line now, no longer a parabola. But of course, we need, we need to plot the parabola first, then we can calculate, the, then we can understand where the line is. So the best portfolio is the one with the highest gradient, which is the uh, highest sharp ratio, highest gradient, and touching the efficient frontier, which is what is being shown on this, this line here. And we call it the tangent portfolio, okay? So the tangent portfolio is the best, the most efficient, all right? Everyone okay with this? Everyone understand where this parabola comes from and now why is it a line now? Everyone's okay? Because we're going to move even further from this. Everyone's okay? Okay, so uh, if remember, you have any questions, just uh, unmute yourself anytime, okay? Okay, now, the next question that we should think about is, okay, so we have a line that touches a parabola and we know this is a tangent portfolio. The question is, which part of the line should I be at? Should I be in this part here? Should I be this part? Should I be this part? Or maybe I should be this part of the line. Which part of the line? So now we need to tackle this question, which part of the line we are supposed to be on, all right? Which is next part of the, um, the, the portion of this. So what's the optimal portfolio choice? So we now we know that the optimal portfolio must include risk-free assets, all right? But then the question is, how much risk-free assets should we include, okay? All right, so all these I've covered already. Uh, so we know that the combination, okay, so this is a bit of this written thing. Um, the combination, most efficient, is combines risk-free and, and its tangent portfolio. Uh, I want to highlight that optimal portfolio no longer depends on the investor risk aversion. Okay, why? Because remember, risk aversion is based on taking in risky assets. But now we know that the optimal portfolio is if you include risk-free assets. So we are not really bothered about the risk aversion anymore because we are talking about um, risk-free assets. Risk-free assets, you don't have any risk at all, right? Okay, so now we need to determine how much risk, uh, what's the proportion of risky and risk-free assets we should have. Uh, okay, sorry, this is a duplicated slide. Uh, no, it's not, sorry, it's not. Okay, so, um, this is just a bit of elaboration. You, uh, you can read, read through it yourself. Basically, what it's trying to say here is that, um, uh, okay, you know what? Maybe we'll move on to the diagram first, right? Then I'll go through this. Okay, so remember the question, is, the question I, asked, uh, I, I posed to you is that which part of the tangent portfolio, like should you be here, 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 or here? Should you be at right and the different portion of the tangent portfolio gives you the proportion of risky and risk-free assets right so that's the question which portion should you be in now of course you want to be as high as possible right on the um this tangent po tangent portfolio to give you higher returns but of course we notice that the higher you are the more risk you are taking right on this line here this is the main line we're talking about okay so the, the, the thing is, can you see this for minus 40%? And can you see it's 40 and 60? So RF, 40% RF is 40% risk-free asset, 60% uh, risky assets. Okay. So if you do a 40% risk-free, 60% um, risky, your return is going to be here. Your return is here and your and your uh, risk is here. Okay. But this is considered risk adverse. That means you are like very conservative. You are a conservative um, kind of investor. But if you are a very aggressive investor, what do you do? Why, what is this negative 40% RF? Anyone knows? What's this negative? What does what negative mean? Yeah, so the question is, what does this negative RF? And anyone has any idea, no idea? Uh, okay, no, no worries, you have no idea. A negative RF means that what? Well, you are taking leverage, okay? So you should write this down, you are taking leverage, which means that you are borrowing money. So you are borrowing at the risk-free rate. So you are borrowing from the government or, or, or whatever. 
40%, and then you are going to use this 40% and buy the market portfolio or the risky portfolio. So you are taking leverage. And remember, when you take leverage, you have higher risk, but your returns are higher. Can you see immediately their returns are higher? So this is um, less risk adverse. Yes, so meaning you're taking leverage for uh, to buy more risky assets, meaning that you're basically borrowing money. So your, your idea of thinking that you're borrowing money to buy more risky assets. So uh, I'm going to go back to this slide, which is basically what's explaining here. So if, um, if the expected return of the tangents portfolio exceeds the return objective, it may be optimal for the investor to hold the tangent portfolio with, okay, fine. Now, the investor may borrow at risk-free rate to take leverage, right? So that you can achieve a higher returns on the tangency portfolio, which is what's happening here. You're taking leverage, all right? You're taking leverage so that you can achieve a higher return at this point here, which is why it's a negative 40%, means that you're taking leverage, all right? So remember, at the end of the day, we are a portfolio manager, right? We are manager, managing someone else's money. So how much return we one must be based on, we must go back to the concept of the IPS, right? What we discuss with our client. And so whether we take leverage or not will depend on the IPS and, you know, risk willingness, we, um, tolerance, ability, etc. everything that we talked about, okay? So this would be the movement along the line, all right? Now, uh, before we move on, I want to highlight this thing that, do you notice this, what was this? Um, CML, what's this? CAL. So a uh, CML is the capital market line, right? CML, a uh, CAL is capital allocation line. So why is there different names? Basically, this line, the equation of this line, y equals to mx plus c, is all the same, right? The only difference is the m component, the sharp ratio. Now the the line that gives you the tangent portfolio has a special name. And this special name is called mark, Capital Market Line, CML. So this is why it's a CML here, all right? The rest are called Capital Allocation Line. So they are not the best, they are not the market line, it's the alert allocation line, all right? Just a bit of a naming convention. Everyone okay with this uh, uh, portion? Okay, okay, so, uh, if everyone's okay, now what is happening? So we're not done with this graph. We still have more to talk about this graph. The next part is, can I actually extend the tail of the, the parabola? What, what, what do I mean? Can I actually extend? Can you see this dotted line here? Can I extend it? Can I extend this part here? And the, the thing, the answer to this part is, yes, you can actually extend this. So how do you extend it? Um, we are going to understand this concept of short position and long position, okay? So, so remember, we have tackled a few components. We have tackled how do we get the parabola, which is this beautiful line here. Then we talk about how we get this tangent portfolio. Then we talk about how we move along the tangent portfolio here. And now the, I guess the final step is how do I increase this line, this parabola to extend it even further beyond what I already have. Okay, and by to do this, we need to understand the concept of short sale. So a long position is the simplest position, right? A long position is basically now I, I want to buy a stock. I go to the market, I buy a stock, and I hold the stock. So there's a long position. Okay, this is a long position here. Now, what's a short position? A short position means that you are going to sell a stock that you do not own. So you do not have the stock with the intention to buy back the stock in the future, okay? Uh, why would anyone want to do a short position? Anyone is a trader, maybe you have some uh, investment knowledge. Do you know why? Okay, yeah, that's good. Uh, oh, yes, correct, goes down, okay? That's very good, yeah. So the most easy concept to understand is, yes, it's going down. That's why you sell the stock, then when the price go down, you're going to buy back stock at a lower price. Correct, that's perfect. But I would like to highlight that this is not the only reason why you do a short sell. 
Okay. Um, another reason why you do a short sell, which is what I mentioned here, is that you can actually do a short sell and then use the money to buy another stock. And when you buy another stock, you hope you, you want to buy a stock that has higher returns than the stock that you short. All right. Yeah. So it's almost like hedging, right? Yeah. But it's not really hedging because hedging has the concept of reducing risk. Short sell is actually a leverage position. Leverage means that you are uh, betting or you are uh, indirectly taking a loan, like a loan. So it's like a leverage position. So hedging is always reducing risk. This is actually increasing your risk, right? But increasing risk means increasing returns, all right? Mm. Okay, so we're extending the curve. So let's look, look at this thing here. Huh? So remember we have our uh, initial parabola here. Now I'll talk about extending this right further down. So we, we do this by doing a short position. And you, again, you notice that now it's a negative weights. All right, and so negative weights means that you are doing either a leverage position or short sell is also a leverage position, which is why it's a negative. All right, so we can move along or extend the parabola. And we have a question here, right, on short selling uh, to further understand how it works. So suppose you have this um, 20K cash, uh, you decide to short 10K worth of Coca-Cola stocks. Uh, and you want to use your this 10k together with your 20k to buy Intel stocks, right? So you want to calculate what's the return. And remember, P P naught is the price now, and then P one plus dividend is the price one year later, or I don't know how many years later. And this is the returns, right? So the question now is, what is your returns if you do this short position? So I want to repeat again, right? Remember, short selling. Yes, you might have you one of the idea is that you have a bearish uh, uh, a position on the stock that you short. But in it, the second reason is that you can actually short a stock in you know to buy another stock that could have a higher return, which is what is happening in this case here. Okay, so to do this question, we first have to calculate how many stocks we are shorting. So we know that initial price of a stock is uh, for Coca-Cola is 40, means that we're shorting 250 stocks. Um, and then the thing is we're going to invest 30K, right, in Intel. So how many Intel stocks are we going to buy? You know, Intel stocks at $25 per stock, we are going to buy 12,000, uh, 12, uh, 12, 1,200 uh, 1, stocks. So um, at the end of the year, we know that these 1,200 stocks will have this value, we get, we'll get this amount here. Perfect, very good. But we know that at the end of the day, we need to close our short position. Clo okay, so what does it mean close short position? It means that you need to um, buy back the Coca-Cola stocks. And how much are you going to buy back? Remember, the stock price of Coca-Cola would have changed. So you need to pay this amount to close your short position, right? Because you need to buy back 250 Coca-Cola stocks. And means what? Your final proceeds that you get, right? This, you need to minus away 10 point uh yeah, 10, 10, 10, 10 106,100 okay um and then you get this amount here okay um and then the what remember in your initial out of pocket amount what you initially invested is 20k right suppose you have a uh, 20k cash so what happens is that, can you see that at the end of the day, you take 27, 200 minus uh, 7,200, and then you will get, and you divide by the 20K, which is the initial investment amount, you get 36. So do you notice something that you're actually taking a leverage because the 10K of Coca-Cola stocks that you shop, you don't actually have these stocks, right? So you're actually it's called borrowing money, uh, yeah, like taking a leverage, like borrowing, in order for you to earn a higher returns than either of the stocks. Uh, I guess in this question, you must read the question that they say that they are shorting these, these stocks. Um, 
in terms of like, oh, how do I determine the perfect proportion of stocks are you short and all this? Um, you have to do a backwards kind of calculation, but you don't have to worry about that. That's not something that uh, you have to do. So uh, the question is like, uh, so which stock to short? Okay, it, it, if you are a trader, right, that's where your expertise comes in. So you need to have a view on the stocks. You need to know which stocks you are to short, right? If you are a trader. Uh, okay, so suppose now we continue the problem. We know that volatility of Coca-Cola is this. Uh, sorry, Intel is 50%, Coca-Cola is 25%. Uh, what's the volatility of the portfolio that you short this amount and you short this? So now we need to calculate volatility of this short uh, position portfolio. So uh, the, the most important concept now is how do you calculate weight? Weight of the Intel, weight of Coca-Cola. So if you're going to short the Coca-Cola in order to buy the Intel, the weight of Intel, remember, is you're buying 30K of Intel, but then... Your original portfolio, original money that you have is only 20k. So you are actually buying 1.5 times the weight. And then for Coca-Cola, you know that you are shorting 10k and your original is 20k. So you are you're actually buying a weight for Coca-Cola of negative 0.5. So this is how the negative comes about. Okay. What's important to take note that the total weight here must always be one. Okay. So you can, one means 100% of the weight, right? So it cannot be more than 100%. So a short position basically gives you a negative, which is why I say when you take leverage, it becomes a negative. And once you know this concept, now it's very simple. You plug it into this formula, which we talk about in lecture 2A, and then voila, you just get your SD for portfolio. And we notice that when we do a short positioning, the volatility of portfolio can exceed the volatility of the stocks, meaning what? We actually taking on more risk in order to get more return. All right, uh, anyone has questions for this? I'm not sure whether you can hear like a whistling sound from my end. Like, uh, like a soft whistle. Okay, I don't know whether you know. Okay, that's good. Um, because it's cold, so there is like a airflow from the outside to the inside, and then the door doesn't close fully. So as the air flows from the outside to the inside, it creates a whistle. But anyway, okay. So um, I guess we do have no questions regarding short selling. Okay, so we have the last part of the the. the uh, modern portfolio theory and we talk about utility function all right so utility basically is how much okay so every investor has a utility meaning like what do you want to achieve right what's the return you want to achieve right and this utility is based on various risk factor uh, risk aversion your tolerance etc so we have this utility function all right and uh, we'll look at the graph again later to talk how we understand utility, but then we have a formula to calculate utility function here. So a utility or expected utility of um, investor is given by UM, which is equals to the expected return of the portfolio minus 0 0.005 times RA, which is the risk aversion um, number of the of the investor and then multiplied by the variance of the portfolio here okay given by here so uh maybe some of you are like oh how, how do you get this funny formula so uh it's actually through uh like empirical kind of testing and also right so you don't really need to like kind of know how this formula is being derived um but you just need to know this formula exists uh and it's an open book exam so you have your notes to refer as well all right Okay, so when RA is zero, means that the um, investor is risk neutral. So he, he is not adverse to any kind of risk, right? So it's possible. Uh, so if you notice that the utility would depend on the uh, variance of the portfolio, which is the mix of the kind of assets, 
right? So there is a penalizing kind of portion here due to the negative, right? So there's a negative, which is why the utility would decrease as your risk of the portfolio increases, which is here. There is a question on utility uh, here. Uh, quite an easy question. Basically, you just plug in the figures uh, to the formula. So what, what is this question saying? Okay, so you have, this person has a risk aversion factor of five. All right, so you try to recommend him uh, asset allocation. So we have three different portfolios, A, B, C. So we plug in the formula. Okay, we know that uh, RA is five, right? We plug in RA here. Now we know there's three portfolios and each portfolio have expected return and standard deviation here. Okay, so we just plug in all the figures like this, plug, plug in and we calculate what's the utility function. And the best utility is the one that is the highest. And in this case, it's uh, portfolio or asset allocation three because it's the highest here. So this is the one that you should choose. Okay, so now we are going to jump back into the graph. So now it's the last component of the graph. So we talk about uh, yeah, the uh, market line, right? We talk about the uh, most efficient portfolio. Then we talk about position of where we want it. Now, how the UTT comes in, right? Is it comes in from the top, okay? It goes, it's like a, I don't know, like a sun ray or something like, it goes down from here. So these are the UTT functions here, like this, all right? And the optimal portfolio now, when we consider the utility of your investor, is the one where your where the investor's utility curve touches the market line, which means that this 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 is the perfect portfolio for your client. Because yes, just now we talk about oh, we can go, we can be at any position of the line, right? Depending on how how we want to, um, how much risk-free assets and how much risky assets we want. But at the end of the day, remember, we are serving a client and we need to calculate what's his utility function. And for him, in this case, in this graph here, his utility function is this part here, which is most likely you need to borrow, right? Remember, so any point that is beyond, beyond this um, portion that touches the parabola here, so beyond here, so any portion that's here, is always a leverage position. Means what? You are going to borrow money in order to invest more uh, risky assets so that you can get a higher return. All right? I repeat again, any por portion that is beyond the point where the two curve, the curve and the line meets, which is here, it's a leverage position. Okay? Here is a, a unleveraged position. Unleveraged. Okay? So, in this case, the best utility is here, which is a leverage position where the utility curve or the quite the indifference curve uh, is the same as utility curve, touches the security market line or, 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 or capital market line, CLM. All right. Any issues with this idea of utility? So I think this is the last component of this uh, curve or this, this diagram that you have seen many times right now. All right. Okay. So we will move on a little. Uh, wait, okay, maybe we should take a break first. Okay, let's take a break. Um, let's take a maybe like a seven minutes break. We'll be back at 8, 7, 0, 8. And then we'll talk about this uh, portion of safety first ratio. So uh, usually I think I mentioned I like to do like two breaks, so it's a bit it's like two short breaks, so we can have like a rest. Uh, yeah, okay. So if you have any questions, just type in a group chat. Uh, we'll come back after the break, all right? See you guys in, uh, in seven minutes.
All right, welcome back. Um, hope you had some tea or coffee or something to drink. Go to the toilet. Um, okay, I see. I see two questions. Um, first of all, how do you determine risk aversion? All right, so the risk aversion is where uh, your role as um portfolio manager comes in. So basically, um, you will give your question or you interview your client, and then remember we talk about um. Uh, uh, risk tolerance, risk ability. So you, you basically have a checklist and based on the kind of checklist, you have a matrix. That's how you get the risk aversion number. So that's how you, get, you determine it. Um, but in terms of like uh, exam questions and stuff, you, you'll be given the value, right? So you don't have to like calculate that. All right, uh, next question is, the relevant position is between both points of the curve. Or is it a specific point? Okay, so uh, let's just quickly look at this idea of leverage position again. Um, so it is basically a specific point because that specific point gives you what how what percentage is being leveraged on. All right. So um, when we talk about uh, leverage position, at this point here is when you have hundred percent. This is 100% risky assets. Why? Because it touches the efficient frontier, right? And the efficient frontier only consists of your risky assets. So this is 100% risky, risky assets, okay? Any point that is beyond this intersection would be your leverage position where you have to uh, consider taking a leverage in order to buy more uh, uh, by a combination of risky and uh, risk-free assets, all right? So it's a specific point. So you can be here. Here will give you, uh, let's say, 20% uh, uh, leverage to buy risky asset. Here is maybe 40%, I don't know. Yeah, so it's a specific point, all right? So what is, uh, okay, utility function. Okay, so utility function, uh, before I answer the, about the part about year one. So UTT function basically is given by this formula here, right? So UTT function is how much uh, risk and rewards the uh, investor is willing to take. And the thing is when we plot this UTT function on this graph here, it will give this line like this, right? And why are there so many layers of line? So these different layers of line is based on the different risk aversion factor, which is your RA, all right? So based on different RAs, we'll get the UTT function. But at the end of the day, why do we even care about UTT function? We care about it because we want to see where this UTT function touches the capital market line or the market line here. And in this case, the UTT function, this... Uh, this thing touches the line at this point here. And so that's why we determine that this is the line or this is the portfolio um, portfolio composition that we want that consists of uh, risk-free assets and risky assets, right? Uh, okay, so, so what are some year one concepts we really need to, Okay, so we need to, uh, the main part that you need to know is your uh, lecture two and lecture three of financial management. Lecture two is time value of money. Lecture three is risk and rewards or risk and returns. So lecture two and three. Does the indifference curve show how much leverage? Uh, no. So remember the indifference curve or the UTT curve uh, remember the function. So this there is no leverage in this component here. So it doesn't show leverage. As in the UTT um, curve, there is no leverage component inside. But when the UTT curve touches the market line, that's this the market line actually is the one that shows the leverage. Okay, so uh, the UTT function has no leverage component per se. Oh, uh, no. So if you revise lecture 2A, 
it should be good. You don't really have to flip all the way back to your uh, like, uh, year one notes. Yeah. So you do lecture 2A. But if you don't understand lecture 2A, okay, then you must go back to uh, your year one uh, notes. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's look at this safety first ratio. So what's this safety first ratio? Basically, it's a, a different form of your sharp ratio. Okay, why do I mention this? So the safety first ratio, right, first of all, tells you uh, or gives you the uh, portfolio that the investor should choose. And again, the higher, the better, all right? Now, why do I say it's a different form of a sharp ratio? you immediately see that this is actually a sharp ratio, just that for this component RL, the sharp ratio is RF, which is free rate. So the safety first ratio changes the RF to this thing called RL, which means the RL is the investor's threshold, or basically what the investor wants to receive in terms of returns. So what the investor wants to receive is the RL, um, layman terms, right? So I, I like to use like simple terms. I mean, you want the very proper like finance term that you read this, uh, yeah, they explain to you, but layman terms is basically what the investor wants to receive, right? So, so the, the, the safety first ratio now gives you the distance or the difference between what's expected from the portfolio and what the investor really wants. Why? Because the, um, the formula is R returns of portfolio minus what the uh, investor wants, right? So gives you that distance, right? And it's measured in standard deviation because you give up by standard deviation. So just these are just like things that you need to kind of like, let's understand you don't memorize and all just for understanding. So highest is the best, uh, better, all right? Uh, again, this one just explains to you, oh, you know what, if the RL is uh, risk-free rate, then you get a sharp ratio. Um, now, what's interesting to take note is that if the, okay, if I go back here, if RL equals to RF, all right, so the, what the investor want, okay, think about it. If what the investor want, the return that the investor want is actually the risk-free rate, it makes sense that you just invest everything risk-free, right? Because there's no risk and the investor only want risk-free rate. You, you, invest, you just invest everything risk-free, all right? Does this make sense to everybody? If the investor wants risk-free rate, which is RL equals to RF, then you just invest everything risk-free. So what's this is what the thing, this last paragraph is saying, or if the RL is less than, but it's just in a very nice way. Lah, okay, so um, you can read about this on your own. But that's what it's saying. If you if the investor want risk-free, just invest everything risk-free. Don't care about portfolio or whatever thing, all right? Okay, uh, if you substitute, then you get the sharp ratio. Um, just, you can just read through this. All right, so um, what's happening here is that now we are given the, again, four, three portfolios, expected returns, standard deviation. We know that um, this foundation, they want uh, RL of 3.5%, right? So you calculate all this. Again, we know that for the safety first ratio, the highest is better. So we take portfolio A. Okay, so remember again that the uh, sharp ratio or now in, uh, okay, the sharp ratio or even the safety first ratio gives you the risk and reward uh, ratio. So the higher, the better, right? Higher uh, returns for lower risk. All right, so that's so much on modern portfolio theory. Now we'll talk about the actual uh, asset allocation. So just now, whatever we covered, right, it's more about um, understanding about how diversification, how you construct a portfolio, right? But that is not, that is like background knowledge that you need to know. Of course, you'll be tested and all, but you need to know before you even start doing your asset allocation. So now we have already so-called understand how 
all this modern portfolio theory we know about the uh, uh, capital market line and all those things right so now we already know that then we can now start doing asset allocation all right so let's look at asset allocation uh um all right so we know that total returns um uh, I think you mentioned earlier can be split into a few portions. We we know that you are only rewarded for taking on systematic risk or beta risk, right? We are not rewarded for taking unsystematic risk. That's why we have a portfolio. Uh, so we know that we can have incremental returns from the asset allocation policy. Uh, remember we talked about including your RF, your risk-free, or the percentage of uh, risky assets. So all these can actually affect your returns um, but not only that we, we will think about whether should we do active kind of portfolio management I think in the first lecture you mentioned active passive or semi-active so these are something we think about um, so these are research papers so this Roger Boxen found out that you know what actually on 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 like three over three quarters of the time the variation of returns actually comes from the market market movement it's only one quarter of the time is due to active management so basically what is what this trying to question is that so should we actually do active portfolio management or maybe we just do passive right we just do etf or something all right but um if anyone asks you because you have taken this course if anyone asks you should we do active you always must say yes anyone knows why why must you say yes? Should we do active? You should say yes. It is a, it is a biased response, but you should say yes because... <laughs> because Rusty. <laughs> yeah, correct. <laughs> yes, you're right. If not, the portfolio manager have no work. So yeah, correct. So it, it, I mean, maybe some of you might be portfolio manager in the future, right? Or like if you're an insurance agent, you also might actually do this because now this insurance do like this kind of like long-term investments and stuff. So yeah, you should always say yes because if not, uh, maybe your classmates also who are portfolio managers, insurance agent, they might not have work. So you must always say yes because if not, everyone will buy ETF, then no one needs a portfolio manager. So yes, you should say yes. Huh? That <laughs> you should do active even though you have this research by Roger E. Boxen that says that only one quarter is due to active management. <laughs> yeah, just dumb into it. yeah, so yeah, people are just dumb into to, to the discount ETF, right? Okay, so uh yeah, so so shows that uh active management uh impact or uh, yeah, okay, so this is more of allocation policy, right? The active management uh of the portfolio is based on the kind of like asset allocation policy, all right. So um now, what drives the returns? Uh, we need to understand that it's driven by, first of all, time horizon. So remember, time horizon is one of your constraints in IPS as well. So the higher or the longer the time horizon, the more risk you can take. When you take more risk, you can have higher returns. So this is how it's related, right? Time horizon, uh, classes of assets. We also talked about this in the last lecture. We talked about stocks, bonds, gold. Remember, uh, I'd like to highlight to you again, gold um, helps to hedge against inflation, right? And we talked about um, real estate. I think some, some of your friends also mentioned that real estate, uh, instead of investing in real estate, invest in REITs, right? Real estate trusts. And trusts are better than real estate if you want to investment because real estate are very illiquid, but a trust, on the other hand, is easily being sold or real estate trust is easily being sold, okay? So those are things that you need to think about. Uh, so remember, you always need to align with the portfolio or the client's uh, risk and return objective, which is defined in the IPS. Um, of course, you need to determine the percentage, uh, whether you're active or passive kind of thing, and you need to do review and balancing, right? This is just a quick uh, recap. Okay, so uh, in terms of asset allocation, we need uh, to determine various factors. So we need to determine the risk and returns. Um, and then we need to know whether we can beat the market, right? Because based on efficient market hypothesis, which is year one again, your year one cost, based on efficient market hypothesis, if your market is fully efficient, you cannot beat the market, right? There's no use trying to trade. So we need to determine whether can you actually beat the market? If you believe that you can beat the market, then you are an active investor. 
uh, what kind of strategy you use, right? How, how often do you trade? What is the various costs involved? Are you using derivative? Um, so these are the trading costs, right? These bit are spread and all this. Okay, so these are the some things to consider. All right, so uh, these are more of the questions you should be thinking when you um, do asset allocation. So what the classes, how much, uh, are you going to diversify? So diversification, yes, you might diversify different industries that like we look at Coca-Cola and uh, Intel. But remember, we can talk about other kind of diversification, right? Geographical uh, diversification. Are you buying from uh, Japan or US or, or UK kind of stocks? Um, and then, of course, we need to think about what kind of the market expectation, whether there's any kind of like idiosyncratic Critic risk that the investor has, or basically like any like a uh, uh, unique circumstances, right? That we talked about, um, that is important. Uh, and then one kind of asset location is called thematic kind of asset location, meaning that you look at the uh, various industries, and then we determine which industries are doing well, and then which one you want to invest in, based on the industry. So based on the team, right? Thematic. So based on like a team. Uh, so this is just uh, like an overview of like criteria, uh, is it homogeneous, uh, mutually exclusive, uh, diversification, remember low correlation, so you want a negative one, which is good, we don't want a plus one, this is important, okay, um, uh, and then what's investable and what, what should be included, etc. So this is just a criteria. All right, uh, this one again, types of assets I won't go through. Uh, basically, just give an overview of what you can consider, right? So remember at the end of the day, like questions usually comes out in terms of like a case study. I think uh, those of you who have started the TMA or even the GBA, right? Um, and you know, GBA grouping has posted, but those of you guys have like just looked at the GBA, you know that it's a case study. And when how we tackle case study is that we should have like, questions in the back of your mind. So in the lecture 2A, I also explain how we tackle the case study in that question. So we should have questions uh, in our mind, which is why I give you all these like things to think about, right? All these like uh, so-called frameworks and stuff to think about. So basically these are like things that we need to have a back of mind when we read the case study so that you're able to tackle them, right? So that's why there are a lot of slides uh, compared to other groups, but then they are basically just like you can just quickly go through that. It's not, not very heavy, right? So, okay, um, capital market expectation. So what do you expect in the market, right? Is the market going on uh, upturn? Is it becoming better? Or now a lot of people talk about recession, right? Two, two, uh, two cycles of negative growth equals a recession. So a lot of people are saying, oh, now we're going to slow down a recession. Um, one of the uh, key thing about recession is that the interest rates are increasing. So if any one of you are following the news in Singapore, we know that the fixed deposit interest rate are going sky high. It's like the other day I saw it was 4.2%. It's like highest in the little home at 20 or 30 years. Yeah, yeah, CIMB, I think it's 4.2, right? Then I think RHB is very high as well. So, um, and then they're only asking for one year deposit. So if any of you are have a bit of spare cash, you want to invest now, go to fixed deposit. Don't bother doing stocks and stuff because now is the bad time to do stocks. So yeah, now, now is a good time to go into safe, um, safe haven investments because we know that we might go in a recession, right? So try to do a uh, fixed deposit now. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then we have this thing called uh, the type of a location called mean variance model. We'll, we'll look in detail about this, so don't worry. Uh, we have, yeah. Uh, okay, so market expectations, we'll go in detail on market expectations next week, but this is just a brief overview of market expectations. How do we formulate market expectations? So it can be based on historical data, be based on, um, you know, some valuation, experience, judgment, um, and one of the forecasting challenge is uh, based on behavioral bias or errors. So uh, I won't go through this because next week we'll go we'll a deep dive into this component. Okay. Um, this is just for you to read through. Uh, this is just basically some 
uh, generic or like a typical kind of a location based on the risk, whether you're moderate, conservative, or uh, moderate, conservative, or conservative. So these are the kind of locations that we do uh, typically, right? Just for you to read through. Okay, alternatives. Now, nowadays, a lot of people like to add alternatives into the um, investment portfolio. Uh, and this alternative, remember, includes like real estate, right? They're alternatives. So what happens is that, remember, at the end of the day, when we keep on adding more and more stocks, our aim, right, is to bring our efficient frontier more and more to the left, right? So what happens is that you add alternative, you might bring the frontier to the left here, right? So it increases the diversification and it gives you a higher, uh, so higher, uh, lower risk at a given return. All right. So this is why we are at alternatives. So we want to bring the frontier more and more to the left. Uh, so uh, does anyone know what is alpha? Have anyone heard what's alpha? Searching for alpha. Any uh, the H? Yeah. All right, okay. So the idea of alpha, right, is based on your security um, or capital market line. Um, basically, what is alpha? So um, let me just quickly jump back to the graph. Uh. Okay, I'm gonna jump back here. So when we think about alpha, right, so whatever that is on the, okay, so for example, if I'm at here, I get this return here, right? Remember here is return and at this risk level, this is what? This is beta risk. So this is again, back to your um, year one, okay? So these are beta risk, right? Whatever that's on the line is beta risk. Okay, where is alpha? Alpha is, for example, here. Let's say I get a return here, okay? My return is this level here. Now my risk is only here. An alpha, risk, an alpha return is anything that exceeds your or above your market line, which is, that means exceeds. So actually, so what, what is trying to say? So the market would say that, oh, if you are taking, let's say this is Y risk here, Y, you're supposed to only get this, let's say 10%. But now you are getting, uh, let's say this is what, uh, 13%. So this additional 3% here is your alpha risk which is called alpha, above the market benchmark. Perfect, yeah, perfect. So your market line basically gives your market benchmark. So this alpha risk, uh, sorry, alpha returns, all right? So you're taking the same level of risk that you're getting above the market. So this is what we want to achieve, all right? So this is alpha. We always want to search for alpha. Um, and then how do we search for alpha? We try to, you know, uh, go into certain kind of like investments, you know, like uh, whether is it certain themes or you take advantage of uh, like bonds or, or, or like what I mentioned, right? Now the interest rate is very high for fixed deposit. So you take advantage, go into fixed deposit now, right? You do a long-term fixed deposit if you're, remember, so if you're, you must at the end of the day have uh, expectation. So if you are an investor, you have expectation that the, fixed deposit rate now is the highest it can be. So you should put, basically, if you have the expectation the highest, you should put all your money into fixed deposit now and you do a long fixed deposit, you do five years, right? You get very high. Of course, this is your expectation. You might be wrong, then you lose money. But if you are right, you, then you lock in a very good rate. So you must have an expectation first, then you jump into the investment in order to so-called try to get the alpha, all right? So there are some key challenges uh, as we invest in the market. Um, there's increasing correlation. So basically nowadays, the market move in like the similar way. So like stocks in different, different kind of um, industries kind of move in a similar way. And where, when do correlation becomes very uh, similar, even for different industry, is when there is a recession. All right, where well, there is a global financial crisis, right? Yeah. So now I think um, if those of y'all who are investing or already started investing, you know that tech stocks are doing very badly 
uh, especially this year, right? You see a lot of layoff. Um, the thing is that if you historically observe the S&P 500, uh, okay, just, so this is a side note. Uh, so if you observe S&P 500, right? You notice that for the past five years, right? The returns on the S&P 500 has been driven by tech stocks. So remember S&P 500 is diversified, right? It has like healthcare, it has uh, you know, manufacturing, oil and gas, it has everything. But the highest uh, component of the stocks that gives you the return is actually tech stocks. So the tech stocks in S&P 500 are the ones that are pushing the returns for S&P 500. And now because tech stocks are doing very badly, you will notice that S&P 500 is doing very badly as well. Uh, so are a lot of ETFs. So if now is basically I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is now is a very bad time to go into diversified portfolios because your returns will likely be very low because your tech stocks are doing very badly. All right. Uh, yeah. So that's just a digression. Um, of course. Uh, some of y'all might have different opinions, you know, feel free to unmute yourself. You feel like, oh, you know what? You should go to tech stocks. And maybe you have different expectations, right? So feel free to unmute yourself to share what kind of expectations you feel, right? If you do have a, a, a view on investments. Uh, okay, so increased volatility, you know, um, with, with like, for example, COVID, there's more volatility. It's very unpredictable, right? And uh, so low U, okay? So this low U component, is not relevant now because we are in a recession. So in a recession, usually the risk-free interest rates increase. So that's one of the hallmark of a recession. So that's why a lot of economies are actually saying that uh, perhaps now is a good time to study, first of all, or if you are already working, make sure you have a very stable job because when we approach a recession, that's where, you know, like in the tech industry, uh, a lot of people are being retrenched. Um, so if you have a stable job, uh, it's good. So stable job meaning you should go into stable industries, right? So uh, uh, stable industries could include like power. Power is a very stable industry. If you go into teaching, it's a very stable, it's a very defensive kind of industry, all right? Uh, okay, so, so much about that. Uh, uh, the selection process, you can look at this. Um, not going to talk too much. Uh, basically, you need to determine what's your risk and return, and then you calculate a portfolio uh, portfolio returns, all right? Okay, so when selecting the kind of investments, uh, there are two kind of methods, top down, bottom up. So bottom up means that you analyze the company, all right? You look at their history, their fundamentals, you do a fundamental analysis. I hope you have heard of it, fundamental analysis. Oh, this is not new. Fundamental analysis. Uh, for bottom up, uh, top down is basically based on the market trends, right? Like I mentioned, now is a good time to go into defensive kind of industries. So let's say if you're interested in investment, you should consider doing investments or uh, in like, let's say power or utilities, right? Um, uh, sing, sing power, these kind of things, right? So those are very defensive kind of industries, which is perfect now. Or you go into um, food, Right, I think if you are uh you want to buy stocks in Singapore, you do Olam, do REITs, yeah, do REITs. So go do something more defensive now, right? So basically, what I'm trying to say is based on the macro or micro um conditions, industry, global uh, uh landscape, geopolitical landscape, all right. Okay, so we let's look at portfolio optimization. So just now, what we talk about, right, is all about. Uh, asset allocation. And remember at the end of the day, right, you notice that a lot of diagrams and stuff. So what, what I'm trying to give you is more like the frameworks. And these frameworks are the things that you can implement into your case study, right? So they 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 are not very detailed, um, but they are just more like questions that you should start thinking of when you read stuff. So these are like what they like top down, bottom up. So when you when you are trying to let's say um write the IPS, right? The IPS for your client. And then you try to mention that, oh, maybe we should do like a bottom up kind of approach to a location where we should analyze a company, you know? So these are just like things that you gives you some ideas to think about, all right? So now let's look at portfolio optimization. So now we already have various portfolio, right? So we assume that we have constructed a portfolio already. Now, what we are trying to do now is to optimize the portfolio, like how many 
what's the percentage and this kind of thing. So we are optimizing now. And there are various methods to optimize it. Um, uh, and we, go, we will go into quite detail, right, in, in all this optimization. So we have the mean, mean variance frontier. This is our main uh, method of uh, optimizing. We have the black litterman, which is based on the main uh, mean variance frontier. We have this um, sub surplus and asset liability management. Um, Experience-based, uh, Monte Carlo will not cover. I hope you have covered this in your other um, uh, causes. Yep, have you all done Monte Carlo? So this is more like simulation-based kind of uh, uh, simulation uh, optimization. Yeah. Anyone, anyone has done Monte Carlo or none of you have done Monte Carlo? Oh, never? <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Okay, this is one of the important. Okay, maybe you do, will do it in, I think you have a few mods, right? Maybe you'll do it in other mods. Multi, yeah, multicolor is quite important. And yeah. Too bad we don't have time to do it, but it is actually quite interesting. Um, okay, so let's think about, um, so these are just some brief, right? So mean variance frontier, basically, you are, there's various constraints that you might have, right? And then you want to maximize the basically returns for a given risk. So this is the mean variance frontier, all right? We'll look in detail what is it. Now, the uh, black litterman is, a, a form of mean various frontier, but you are first of all doing a, a reverse engineering of the type of portfolio that you should create based on the risk and return objective, right? So this model is just your reverse engineering. Okay. Okay, one more. The, this is an important concept. I'll just put a star here. Why? Do you notice that so far? We have always talked about assets, right? Asset allocation, um, uh, yeah, asset allocation. Uh, what kind of assets you choose, right? Bonds, stocks, etc. Now, a question to to all of you is: Can we, um, can we change the? Okay, so just now when we talk about assets, right? We talk about diversification, reducing risk, right? Now, remember a balance sheet has two components, asset, liability, and owner's equity, right? So we will we'll only talk about one part of the balance sheet, which is asset. Now, in terms of liability, anyone knows whether, can we reduce the risk of a liability on our portfolio? Remember that we are talking about clients, right? They have both asset and liability, and owner's equity will just leave aside, okay? But we have tackled asset component. For the liability component, are we able to reduce risk of a liability? Anyone? So the question is, are we able to reduce risk of liabilities? Because we talk about assets, right? And we say we can diversify the risk, we reduce the risk. So in liability, for liabilities, are we able to reduce risk of liabilities? Or no one knows? <laughs> okay. So this is something you should uh, write down. Okay, it sounds feasible, right? It sounds like uh, maybe you can reduce risk of liabilities. So, as a good portfolio manager, okay, somebody say yes. Okay, so as a good portfolio manager, right, you always need to consider the balance sheet. Um, that's how I like to think, right? If I'm a portfolio manager, I will think of the balance sheet. And when you think about balance sheet, we need to tackle every component of the balance sheet. And we have already tackled a lot on the assets. Now, for the liabilities component, unfortunately, yes, it sounds like you can reduce risk, but unfortunately, unfortunately, you cannot reduce risk of a balance sheet. Uh, sorry, of a liability. Now, for a liability, you can only hedge the risk. So somebody mentioned hedging earlier. So liabilities can only be hedged. Hedge meaning what? Hedge, the idea of hedging means that you, if you have a liability L here, okay, L, you have a liability L, which is like, let's say 1,000. 
how do you reduce the risk of liability? You cannot, because liability is, you are liable, right? You are forever liable to this $1,000. How you are supposed to deal with liability is you find another position to hedge this. So you, you, you do a hedging. So what do you mean? For example, um, you buy a derivative. So uh, this a bit out of the uh, scope of the cost, but liabilities, you're, what you're supposed to do with liabilities, you do hedging. So you need to know that you can, you must hedge liabilities, okay? So that's what you need to know. But how you do it, you don't need to know. Uh, but if you're interested, how you do it is you do a hedge and you buy a derivative. For example, you buy a forward, right? Or options, yeah, perfect. You do options or forward. Uh, Usually options are better, uh, but options sometimes can be a bit uh, difficult to understand. Put and put options and stuff. So let's do an easy one. Do a forward, right? A forward means that you predict that something is going to increase in the future. All right. So if you have that expectation, the prediction, then you buy into something, right? You buy into let's say stock A, and you predict that it's going to increase in the future. And yes, it does increase in the future. And therefore, you get let's say if increase in the future, you get another one thousand. And so this hedges the liability. So you are able to pay off your liability in the future, right? Or options are actually, so options is another kind of derivative in case not everyone knows. And it's even better, but we will not talk about that, all right? But it, options is one, one, one thing you can buy. So I repeat again at the end of the day, uh, assets can be reduced. The risk of assets can be reduced. It's good, but liabilities cannot be reduced, all right? How we reduce the, the risk of a liability is only through hedging. Okay, so we need to know that you only can hedge. So this is something very important. And because of that, we have this optimization that based on both the um, assets and liability. So traditionally, a lot of portfolio managers just focus on assets, right? But then increasingly, because of the volatility in the market, um, Clients have been asking the managers to manage their liabilities as well, which is why, why we have this thing called ALM, right? Asset Liability Manager. So we manage both liabilities and assets. And if you are ever a popular manager, do remember that you, um, uh, what, what Drew say in, in this course is that you need to hedge your liabilities. Huh? You cannot reduce the risk uh, of your liabilities. All right. So experience-based approach uh, is one of them as well. So let's go into detail now, all right? Um, so what is this mean variance frontier approach? So we have two kinds of mean variance frontier. We have this thing called unconstrained and side constraint. So you see a lot of words here. You know, it's like, wow, it's one big chunk of things. It's very simple. Um, in layman terms, right, is that an unconstrained kind of frontier, it means that your weight, right, can be negative, can be zero, positive, whatever, we don't care. So it's unconstrained, basically. You can any kind of weight. Now, a sign constraint simply means that you do not want any short selling. So why do you not want short selling? Anyone? Just now I already mentioned, I said, why, why is short selling uh, not favorable sometimes? So the question is, why is short selling not favorable? Yes, perfect. So you're taking leverage. So sometimes, yes, more risky, higher returns, yes, but you're taking leverage, higher risk. So sometimes your um, client might be uh, restrict you. So it's a sign constraint kind of optimization where they don't want you to do a negative um, weight or basically they don't want you to take leverage, they don't want you to do short selling, okay? Um, yeah. So uh, 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 interesting thing about short selling is that, uh, as you know, the stock market crashed quite badly last late last year and even this year, right? So a lot of short sellers got very badly burned because basically when you do a short sell and you cannot close your short selling position, you need to realize the loss. Uh, yeah. So and if you do not have liquidity, yeah, <laughs> correct. So if you do not have liquidity you basically go into bankruptcy, right? Because you do not have liquidity to close off your short sale position. So, uh, you know, in case any of you are interested, like this really interests you, right? Then uh, I'm not sure whether they have, uh, uh, SUSS have a derivative course or uh, teaching you how to do derivative and structured products, but that is actually a very interesting topic to discuss, right? So when you have a short selling position, how are you going to 
manage your short selling position? Are you going to hatch this position? Oh, there is. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Then, then, yeah. Okay, good. There is. <laughs> All right, so okay, now going back to this topic. Now, unconstrained, uh, unconstrained uh, mean variance front here. So uh, this is just a very typical example of unconstrained. So unconstrained means you can do anything, right? Um, okay, so you have two portfolios now. One portfolio, 70, 20, 10, which gives you 10% here. And you have now portfolio 30, uh, sorry, 50, 30, 20, and give you 8%. Right, so now you want to do a um, mean various portfolio that gives you somewhere in between 9.5 percent. So, how do you determine this 9.5 percent? Basically, you use this idea of a mean variance frontier where you calculate you let the weight of the first, first portfolio be W and the weight of second one minus W. All right, and then what you do is that you calculate what is W here, you calculate what's W and after calculating what's W, you find that W is uh, 0.75 or 75%. What does this mean? It means that you are doing 75% of um, uh, portfolio, pot one, and 25% of pot two. So now you're being asked to calculate what's the individual weight of the asset. So you need to take 75 times 70%, 25 times 50%, you do like this. This uh, a wrong. This twenty percent time uh thirty percent times this, and last but not least, say five percent here times ten percent, twenty five percent times twenty percent. So basically, what you're doing is you you are trying to determine the weight of each asset that you need to buy based on this concept of um mean variance uh frontier. So you calculate what's the weight and then you plug it. So this is the answer here, all right? Moving on to a side constraint. So basically, like I mentioned, it's exactly the same. You just don't want to do a short selling, right? So let's look at this example here. Uh, so uh, Robert has this uh, investment. He's an investment committee chair, which has a spending rate of this. So he has spending rate of this. He knows annual inflation of this. Ah, okay. So you have this annual cost of uh, earning investment returns. So basis point, uh, remember basis point, how you convert basis point to a percentage, you need to divide by 100, right? So this is 0.436%. And remember, percent you need to convert back to decimal. Uh, I think that one you know. Okay, so basis point to, you need to know basis point and percentage are different. Uh, important to take note. Sometimes they will treat you like this. Okay, so you have... Um, one, two, three, four, four count of um, asset classes. All right. And now you have um, five different portfolios with different portfolio weights. Okay. Um, not too bad. All right. So they're asking you to recommend a strategic portfolio asset allocation for Robert um, based on his re requirements. So these are his uh, return requirements. Huh? So let's calculate what his return requirements first. So return requirements, you need to, First of all, add in inflation. You need to add in what's his annual requirement. And this one, uh, what's three point five? This is your spending rate. So you calculate what's your uh, required return here. Okay. After calculating a required return, you see it's 6.29. So let's flip back to your portfolios. Because remember, we are doing mean variance uh, frontier optimization, right? So we know that we need a, we require a 6.29. What 6.29%. So let's look at which portfolio can give you this. Can you see that it's portfolio three and four between here? So we know that it's somewhere between portfolio three and four will give you expected return of around 6.29. So what do we do? We let the weight of portfolio three be uh, W and let the weight of portfolio four be one minus W, All right? Which is what's being done here. And then you calculate what is the weight required. And we notice that, oh, we require 50% of each portfolio. So once we know that we require 50%, we just plug in the 50% into the portfolio construction weights. Can you see that these are the portfolio construction weights? So for portfolio three and four, you have 50.22% of asset one, blah, blah, blah. And then you just plug it in, right? 
50%, 50% just at all, and then you get this, the individual weights of each asset that you have to purchase. So this is the optimization that we're doing there. Uh, any questions regarding this optimization? Oops. We are good, okay. I think it's quite direct the optimization. So basically, this, this is what mean various optimization is. Of course, we know that a portfolio in this example is easy because it has four assets, but you know, you know, to diversify all your unsystematic risk, you need at least 40 assets. So it can be very heavy, right? The optimization can be very heavy. So we need special, you know, kind of programs to do it, uh, or even coding to do it. Now, one issues, this, so these are some limitations of uh, the mean variance frontier is that it's very sensitive to uh, small changes or what's your estimated uh, returns. Remember we, when we calculated, we need to know this, right? So it's very sensitive to this, the requirements and not only that, but it's very sensitive to your portfolio returns, right? what's your expectation of the returns on portfolio, which will determine your weight and then your weight will determine your asset allocation. Okay, so it's, it's very sensitive. And because of this sensitivity, um, usually uh, practitioners or professionals would uh, give a range or they do multiple simulations. So one example is to do this idea or this thing called resampling. So you keep on re redoing the calculations or simulations for each of the uh, mean various frontier in order to get a frontier that is like an average, right? This thing like an average. So this is basically a, a nice explanation of what's been done. But the, the easy way to understand is just, I'm just keep resampling it, keep, keep on doing it to get an average, that's all. So when we get average, then, Generally, the risk is lower, the returns are more, um, the mean returns, right? They're better, they're more like stable. That is what I was trying to say, recently. All right. Okay, maybe we'll just take a quick uh, seven minutes break here. We'll come back at 8.02 before we go into black determinant approach. All right. So like I mentioned, usually I try to do two short breaks so we can take a break, rest, have, a, have some drink, go to the toilet. All right, so we're back at 8.02.
right, welcome back. Hope you have a sh good short break. Now, um, any questions, as usual, any questions, just post them. Um, so let's continue on this black determinant approach. Um, basically what we do, right, is a type of um, mean variance uh, frontier approach or optimization. The main difference is now we need to reverse engineer the returns for the diversified portfolio. So you need to do a reverse engineer, right? Uh, for a diversified portfolio based on the IPS or your, your investor's point of view. So these are just some uh, steps to do it. I believe you need not do it. Yeah, you don't. I don't think they'll ask you to ever do the black determinant approach because it's you. You cannot do it um, on Excel and stuff. Uh, it's a bit complex. So you just need to understand the concept of how to do it. All right. Um, basically it helps to overcome certain problems of the input sensitivity, right? Because remember the mean variance frontier is so sensitive to your returns calculated on your various portfolios, your assets and stuff. So this reverse engineering approach helps you to correct that. Um, and nowadays, I think if you are, if you are invest, if you are like a trader or you are a fund manager, um, Products like Bloomberg and stuff, they actually can help you do it. So uh, typically you don't really need to manually calculate. It, all right. So um, how the black determinant approach works is first you choose a global benchmark, all right, they reach the various assets, and then you basically back soft the um, type of expected returns. And then what you do is you add in the invest investors uh, objective of view right so you add it in and then after that you calculate the equilibrium again so you then use the mean variance approach that what we did earlier to calculate so the, 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 the first two steps is more of using a benchmark and then using a benchmark to uh, back solve the various returns of the assets then include the uh, investors view and then after that you use your mean variance frontier approach all right so that's a black determinant approach. Uh, so this is just a repeat uh, of how we do it, use the benchmark and all. Uh, I'll not repeat again. I mean, it's just written in a more um, proper finance language, right? So this is a depiction of how you do it uh, for you for understanding to your investor point of view uh, and then your global benchmark. So you add them up together and then you get an asset, asset allocation based on that. All right, uh, okay, so we talk about surplus optimization. We already uh, talked a little about it. Uh, and we say that, you know what, um, when you talk about surplus optimization, we need to think about liabilities, right? So not only assets, we need to think about liabilities. And how do we optimize liabilities? We need to do hedging. So, um, so we consider uh, both the liabilities uh, so again, for liability, it's the same thing. So we need to consider various factors for liability, such as how much risk, you know, what is the maturity of your liability, right? What's the amount of your liability? So all this plays a role in uh, liability management. Uh, now, so what, what, what's the last point trying to say is that usually for liability management, one example of hedging that can be done, which is not like a derivative, is to actually buy into a fixed income instrument. So what does this fixed income instrument mean? It means that you're buying a bond, right? Remember how a bond works. A bond works in a sense of get, getting coupons every, um, let's say, semi-annual, right? When you get coupons every semi-annual, your coupons basically is, allows you to pay off your interest of your liability. So what happens is that you, you hedge your liability by buying a bond, right? Which pays coupon, which hedges your, let's say your, uh, you take a loan, right? So you, hedges, you hedge against your loan. Uh, and then the principal of your bond at maturity will allow you to pay off your loan as well. So you are doing a hedging, right? So this is an example of um, kind of hedging that you can do. Okay, uh, the next approach is simply just experience-based. So meaning that what? Oh, you are experienced fund manager, you know, you kind of know your staff, you know, know whatever to do. And then you, you kind of have this kind of market 
um, market uh, uh, kind of benchmarks, right? So for example, we do a 60-40, I think some of you might have heard it if you have done other causes, you should do a 60-40 allocation. Um, depending on the risk aversion, you should increase the allocation to bonds. Uh, investors should have, uh, they have a longer time horizon, can take on more risky assets. Uh, younger investors should be more aggressive. So these are like more, um, or older investors should be less aggressive. So these are more like market-based kind of experience, right? So if you're in industry for a long time, you might have this kind of, um, kind of uh, approaches, right? Of course, these approaches are based on uh, valid type of uh, foundation, like all the calculations that we did. But after a while, if you have experience, you need not do the calculations, right? You can suggest all this. Okay, so we now move on to tactical and strategic asset allocation. So what is strategic asset allocation? So strategic means that you, like what you say, strategic, right? Yeah, so you select the assets based on the kind of return that you want, the kind of risk that you want. So you are, you are um, very careful in selecting, all right? Uh, so we, when we talk about strategic, we need to think, uh, take into account all the IPS constraints that we have. So I want, I want to re, uh, recap that the IPS is very important. So we always need to take account IPS when we think about strategic uh, asset allocation. And we talked a little about strategic asset allocation last lecture. Now we go into detail, right? So we need to think about IPS. And when we think about IPS, we think about all these constraints. Um, and remember we talked about liquidity. We, we also talked about generation skipping. I hope you two remember what's generation skipping, right? So you talk about tax concerns. So all these are things are things that we need to think about in strategic asset allocation. We need to think about systematic risk. But now remember, we have learned the uh, modern portfolio theory. So we need uh, it's not only about asset allocation, we need to think about whether we are include risk-free assets. Are we going to take leverage? Are we going to do a short selling? So all these are things that we should think about, right? So that's why we study uh, so many like details, right? Um, and of course, we need to review uh, the circumstances with our investor, all right? Uh, again, uh, we bring up the same concepts. So we have the uh, asset management approach, uh, asset liability management approach, which again says about uh, hedging of liabilities. We have the asset only approach. So this is a very old concept um, nowadays. We don't use this anymore asset approach. We need to think account kind of liabilities as well um, because it tends to be favored because we need to manage the volatility of our uh, investors' liability, right? Okay. So um, maybe just one more thing I'd like to talk about for... Uh, liability is rate sensitivity. So if any of your uh, were in the market or is in the market to buy a house and you take a mortgage, a lot of the mortgage nowadays um, are based on, okay, previously was fixed rate. So those that are in the market to buy a house or already have bought a house uh, would know about the fixed rate, floating rate kind of mortgages. So previously, a lot of mortgages were floating, uh, fixed rate mortgages, right? Fixed rate meaning that you pay a fixed um, interest for like five years or 10 years, all right? Nowadays, because of the volatility in the market, I think from late last year to even this year, many of the banks are offering a fixed floating. So what's fixed floating? So it fixed for like two years and floating for the next three years, let's say. Now, why I bring out this concept is that the fix is good in a sense that you know how much you're going to pay. But the floating now will be based on a benchmark, right? We're talking about a benchmark. And when we have this kind of floating rate, if you are a portfolio manager, you might want to actually hatch this interest rate risk. And that's where liability management comes in, right? So you let's say if a case study ever comes out about floating rates, Usually it's like one or two lines. They'll say like, oh, he has like a floating rate loan. So when you think about floating rate loan, immediately in a case study, you should be very um, cognizant or should be aware that, oh, okay, maybe I should do liability management. I should hatch your floating rate. So you should maybe 
get a, 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 a floating rate bonds, right, to hedge your liability so that your, your um, investor would not be exposed to the fluctuating interest rates, all right? So that's something you can think about. Or you can uh, suggest that, you know what, maybe I buy into a type of investments that is based on floating rates, all right? Um, so that means the investor will pay me based on the uh, float of the market. So that the, the basically you have to match the float with the float, the floating with the floating. That's the concept. Okay. Uh, any questions regarding this? Okay, so a sample location, this is just uh, for you to see nothing uh, too exciting. All right, so let's look at this uh, sh really short example. Uh, so you have this Ingo Fund, uh, it's a Swedish uh, foundation. Um, it has a sharp ratio. The pop, it has a portfolio with a sharp ratio of this. The fund is considering a US real estate. Real estate has a sharp ratio of this. Um, the correlation is this, right? So we have the correlation, we have the existing portfolio. So what we should consider is what is the um, impact of the correlation of the US real estate with the existing portfolio. So we find we multiply a sharp ratio times the correlation. And we notice that by including this uh, real estate, your sharp ratio is going to decrease to 14, 0 0.14. And your existing sharp ratio, which is the risk and reward ratio for your real estate is 0 0.12. So what does this mean? It means that since it's lesser than your 0 0.14, then maybe you shouldn't include this real estate, US real estate into your portfolio. So this is quite, there's a very simple calculation, all right? Okay, so we have one more example here. Um, this is a bit more like a case study now. So you have, uh, so Ian has a net worth of this, it comprised of a home. So when you, when, immediately when you see home, right? Uh, you must think about that home is illiquid, okay? So you need to think about illiquid really. Um, and he plans to make a gift of this amount. Oh, wait, he before that, in the first paragraph, he said that he has a, re a real return objective. Remember last lecture, we talked about nominal and real and all those things. So we have a real uh, objective of 3%, a standard deviation of 15% or less, okay? Um, he has, uh, inf there's inflation of this, again, the cost of living on um cost of earning investment returns is 40 basis point, which is um 0.4 percent. I like to I always like to put it this way. Uh again, um, like I mentioned, the RA or risk aversion factor of three is usually given. Um and yeah, to the extent he undertake additional uh, real estate investment, so he might want to take out additional real estate investment. Uh he will include this amount in the real estate. Uh, uh, allocation. So his existing real estate will be part of the real estate portfolio, basically. That's what I'm trying, what I'm trying to say. The risk-free rate is this. All right. So when you're given risk-free rate, right, try to think immediately of the uh, capital market line. Remember when we talk about adding risk-free assets into the risky portfolio. So the question can be very indirect in a sense. They will not ask you like, oh, you you must include a risk-free asset inside your portfolio. Sometimes they might, but they could actually just say, oh, construct a portfolio, right? In this case, this construct a portfolio is very generic. So you need to consider both the portfolio with the uh, risk-free asset and one that is just purely risky assets. So let's look at this example here. Uh, wait, we have a little more information. Uh, no, sorry, this is a repeat slide. So just omit it. Ah, we have additional information. So these are asset classes. Um, these are the portfolios that we have. We have eight different portfolios. We have the various uh, portfolio percentage, returns and standard deviation, sharp ratio. So these are just all information that uh, we have. So remember the first step, right, is always to determine what's the re uh, return requirement. So let's determine re return requirement. So return requirement or return objective you remember include your uh, inflation, what you have to receive 
well, the earning, and then this is, uh, let me see what 3% is again. Uh, your objective, uh, real return objective, all right? So we include this to find his return uh, requirement, all right? And so you see 6%. So let's flip back to this part. So 6% is where? 6% is between here and here, right? Portfolio 5 and 6. So we want to find a portfolio that is between that. And we use the same method. So we let W be the portfolio of 5 and 1 minus W to be portfolio of 6. And then we can calculate this, right? Okay, what's W? Once we calculate W, um, we can do the asset allocation now. Because remember, at the other day, we want to allocate assets. All right, so we allocate the assets into these components here, right? Um, based on the um, portfolio uh, five and six weights. All right, and then we calculate what's the standard deviation uh, of these combination of portfolio and okay one thing to take note Ra, in, in this question is assume that there is no correlation between portfolio five and portfolio six but this might not be the case huh? so if there is correlation we need to take account of the correlation using the, the square root uh, uh correlation formula uh yeah I mean, there's no space to write it but it's the w square plus there and then uh, then plus correlation times uh, standard deviation times standard deviation times um, the weights, all right? Weights times weights. So in this case, the correlation is assumed to be zero. So there's no correlation between the portfolio five and six. Uh, okay, so we, we find that the portfolio has standard deviation of this, all right? Uh, your real estate weight is this based on your weights given here. And you have... Based by calculating the standard deviation, we can calculate what's the utility function of your investor based on portfolio on this portfolio A. Okay. Now remember, I told you that um the, in this kind of question, it can be very general. They don't say that oh, you must include a portfolio with risk-free asset, but then you need to understand that adding risk-free assets would or could reduce your risk, right? At the same time, maintaining your um uh, uh returns because you are actually what we are getting the tangent portfolio which uh, uh which is what we want the tangent portfolio right so when when you have that kind of image in your mind right remember the curve and the tangent i'm just going to repeat by drawing this very um ugly graph right here where you have the tangent like this okay so uh you need to think about tangent, tangent portfolio. So when you have this idea of tangent portfolio, which is why we spend like an hour talking about it, uh, we need to consider having a risk-free asset. So if you notice the last one, it's all about having two portfolio, portfolio five and six, and both of them are risky assets. So when we think about having a risk-free asset, we, need, we know that we do want a, what's the return? Uh, 6%. So when you look at 6%, right, we should be at portfolio 5, right here, because it's 6%. And then your risk-free asset will reduce your returns, right? So we want to consider portfolio 5 in our second construction. So we, we, we think about portfolio 5 um, with a risk-free asset now, and we calculate, we, we let the weight be y for the portfolio 5 and 1 minus y for the risk-free asset. And then we calculate what is the value of y required. Okay, well, uh, what's the value of portfolio 5 required? And we do the same thing. Uh, we put in all this detail. Remember that we now need to include the weight of the risk-free asset, which is basically just 1 minus y here. All right. Now, this is not all because once we have calculated the weights, we need to also calculate what is the standard deviation of the portfolio with the risk-free asset. And again, in this case, we do not need to consider correlation uh, like what I mentioned earlier because your risk-free asset correlation or not correlation, but standard deviation of your risk Three equals to zero, right? There's no risk, basically. So um, your standard division, can you see that it is, oh, is 
7.3, which is 0.89% of your 8.21. Again, using this, we can calculate what's the utility of your uh, investor based on portfolio, the second portfolio construction. All right. And what do we notice? Remember when we say utility, we want to choose the highest utility, right? Um, 5.2 versus what's the utility? 5.17. So the portfolio with the risk-free asset actually gives you a higher utility than the combination of portfolio 5 and 6. And so we should choose the portfolio with the risk-free asset. All right? Um, and now... So this is done. We should choose the portfolio with which you asset. But this is not the end of the question. The question actually asks, how much of real estate should you invest in? Right? So we know that we are going to make a gift of uh, 150K. Let's flip back uh, just to repeat uh, in case you, uh, you might have forgotten the question. So remember, we, we, are, we are going to make a gift of 150k in six months. All right. Uh, you have a net worth of this, and remember that your current house of 240k will be part of your total real estate allocation. So now we want to find out what how what's the value of your real estate allocation should you make. So we really know find out that based on the risk free, including risk free assets, we should have a 23.7 real estate uh, weight allocation, okay? We should be calculated here. So based on the 23.7, we, we can actually calculate what is the recommended real estate allocation by first again 23.7, multiply by your net worth that you have, minus away the gift, right? So you need to less away the PV of the gift. So I hope if you remember your... Uh, your time value money because you always need to consider time value money when you think about finance, right? So, of course, your gift first is given in six months. Your gift, the value of your gift now is lesser, right? By uh, because of the discount factor of your risk free rate, risk free of six months. You need to discount it, right? Okay, so once you determine your, your recommended asset location for to real estate, we need to less off your. 240k because this is your what you already currently have in your real estate in your house right because of your house so what we need at the end of the day for new investments in real estate is this amount okay i'm going to pause here for a while this is a quite a lengthy question and a very typical way of how uh, asset location questions can be asked uh, I'd like to pause any questions regarding this example that we have went through. Okay, yeah, I need time. Yeah, it's a bit heavy. Okay. Um, yeah. So don't worry, lucky you have uh, the slides are very comprehensive. You can look through the examples, trace the steps, right? Yeah. Okay, why is it PV of gift uh, at 0 0.5? Because they say that um, we are gifting in six months. Let me just flip back to the question. Can you see this thing here? He plans to make a gift to his favorite charity in six months. So the gift will only happen in six months. Therefore, you need to PV it. So in six months, so six months later, you are giving 150k. But remember, if you are giving 150k in six months, the value of your gift now is lesser, right? Because you need to discount it back to year zero. So this is back to your year, year one module on time value of money. I'm not sure whether all of your like time value of money. <laughs> yeah, but this is time value of money basically. So that's why you need PV your gift. So uh, again, I want to repeat, like, if you are taking this as a year one mod, you can, but you should have some um, knowledge or little knowledge on uh, financial, the model of financial management, where you talk about time value money, we went in very detail about how, why we do all this, right? Um, because I think in the next lecture, we also will talk about uh, valuing bonds, 
uh, and so we need to know about annuity. So that's chapter two of your year one. So you need to talk about an, uh, ordinary annuity. You need to think about the Gordon Grove model to value stocks. So yeah. Yeah, that's right. So uh, six months. So it's 0 0.5. Okay, so that's about strategic asset allocation. Now we talk about tactical asset allocation. So tactical means that you want to take advantage of the short-term kind of like changes in the market, right? So there's a bit of short-term change. And because of the short-term change, we want to reallocate the weights of assets to different uh, portfolio or different classes to, to, to get more returns. So that's the meaning of technical. So basically you're trying to make more returns based on uh, reallocation, all right? Based on the market conditions. All right, so this, this is a nice way to put it. You can read through it yourself. Uh, but if you understand what I say, then yeah, uh, you can write this in your answer in case exam come up, you should write it in a proper way, right? Um, okay, so when we do technical asset allocation, we generally do this based on the business cycle. So we know that certain, like let's say certain industry is doing well, certain industry is not doing well. So you want to allocate it based on the business cycle of the particular industry, right? Um, generally, uh, we'll go into detail on this business cycle next week. But generally, when the company is, uh, on the upward cycle, right? That means going up here. Uh, we want to, of course, put in your position here so that you go up and then you sell your position here, right? Of course, the question is, how do you know the cycle ends? That's where you look at historical data. Maybe you are like, a, you, you try to, maybe you have insider information. You maybe you try to talk to the, the managers or the CEO of the companies to try to find out, right? Or you are maybe very familiar with the industry, so you know. So the, the, the point about technical uh, asset location is that you must have an expectation and then you put in the money here and you sell the asset here, All right? <laughs> um, we, so like just now I mentioned, the signs, the sign in the market has been showing that we are actually approaching a recession. So we, I think a few countries, I'm not sure where America has it, uh, whether it's America, but we a few countries have the two or more periods of uh, negative growth, right? So two periods of negative growth equals to a uh, recession. Yeah, and yeah, so bond has inverted as well. Uh, inflation has increased. So generally in a recession, inflation will increase very high. Um, and interest rate for... Um, uh, sorry, risk-free interest rate will also increase. Bond will be revert, uh, inverted. The bond yield will be inverted. So the, the, what we are saying is that most likely we are in a going to a recession. And generally, uh, a business cycle is 9 to 11 years, right? So this, okay, so basically what I'm going to talk about is not in the uh, uh, syllabus, but basically a uh, business cycle is 9 to 11 years, which means that some economists say that we have already reached the, the the middle right the median of the 11 years so called so generally it should go downwards from now uh and so i don't know uh maybe maybe we should go into or if you are looking to change your job try to change your, go to a safe, more safer industry because once it goes very down uh, if your job is the kind that is very volatile uh for example if you are in finance industry that's very volatile um you might lose a job. So yeah, if you go into something safer, you might be better. <laughs> uh, no, but then you never know, right? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of factors as well. Like for example, if you are in the finance industry, but let's say you work for, let's say five years or 10 years, okay, maybe 10 is a bit extreme, but some of you might have worked for five to, five to 10 years, right? Then if they do, um, let's say retrench you, they have to give you a large retrenchment benefit, right? So the chances of them retrenching you if you have worked for a long period of time will be lower. So it really depends, right? Uh, of course, there are many factors such as if you are working in a big company uh, like MNC, where they might have mass layoff, like what you see in Amazon, in Facebook, right? Um, but not only that, if you are working in a smaller in that, a small company, like a small SME, 
they might have liquidity issues as well. So it's almost like going back to IPS, right? You need to think about liquidity. So if the company is unable to survive through the low business cycle, in order to improve liquidity position, they might have to lay off some workers. So yeah, it's almost going back to your IPS. So you need to think about constraints and stuff, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if you manage cash liquidity, then um, you will have the first mover's advantage. You will be able to know when the liquidity is going down uh, and then you know when to cash out or, or, or maybe um, uh, 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 you can warn your, your friends <laughs> or your, uh, not friends, like your colleagues, right? Um, or the thing is, you should manage the liquidity even better, right? You need to be very careful when you manage the liquidity. So you make sure your company don't, be, don't become illiquid. Uh, okay, so let's go back to diversification. So when that diversification fail, so generally, right, that's a good question on where, do, where are we at now? Because when we are in a crisis, generally diversification all converges together. So all the markets, right, regardless of, the classes, the geography, the, the segments, whatever, the industry, right? Everything will converge together in a crisis, like let's say a recession, right? And because of that, there's no use to diversify, which is why, again, I repeat, in a recession, go into, your, for investment, go into safe haven investment, right? Invest in gold. If you notice that gold prices has been increasing like crazy because a lot of um, big investors are going into gold. In fact, um, as another small digression, so one of the countries, one of the few countries, right, is that uh, so far have not reported uh, two periods of negative growth is actually Switzerland. So if you are interested, right, there, uh, you can read more about Switzerland. What happens is that Switzerland has a very large stockpile of gold. And when you talk about gold, it's physical gold. So basically, the central bank in Switzerland store a lot of gold. Even Singapore, we have actually storage of gold. Of course, no one knows where unless you're like Ministry of Finance or something. But it's stored somewhere, right? Because you need the physical gold. So what happened in Switzerland is that they have a large um, storage of gold or investments in gold. And because of that, right, gold helps to hedge, first of all, against inflation. But not only that, because of the recession in other parts of the world, the gold price has been increasing very high. And therefore, Switzerland is able to escape or the central bank in Switzerland is able to uh, use various policies to mitigate recession in the country. So Switzerland is one of the very, I guess, very, um, first of all, wealthy, but then very smart nation that actually invested a lot in gold. Uh, and so they are able to uh, circumvent so-called now the slowdown. So the economy in Switzerland is doing well, Yes, uh, um, tourism is down due to COVID and all, but in terms of their production, GDP is still on the rise. Uh, yes, you can buy gold ETF, uh, but now gold ETF is very high, uh, it's expensive. Now, but from, a, from a, a central bank perspective, right? If you are a central bank, you cannot buy ETF because in order to hedge against inflation, a central bank has to purchase physical gold. So yeah, but as an individual, yes, you can buy ETF to hedge against inflation. But I think now it's very high. So uh, if your expectation is that we will go into a full-fledged recession, then you should remember, now remember, always go back to expectation, right? So if you expect that you are going to a full-fledged uh, uh, um, recession, you should buy a gold now, right? Because that means gold price will increase even further. So it really depends on expectation, right? Uh, okay, so... So all these are just uh, things that that uh, want to warn you that uh, liabilities can only be hatched away. Uh, be be careful of diversification. Basically, means like you are diversifying, but into worse conditions because of maybe a crisis and stuff. Um, of course, there is no way. What what do you mean kill risk? So kill risk is basically black swan events like risk that is very high in magnitude, but very low in probability. For example, COVID, right? No one actually predicted COVID, or maybe some did, uh, and then they have a whole conspiracy on it. But maybe if you are able to predict COVID, you are able to um, hedge against your tail risk. So tail risk is high 
impact events with low probability. Okay. All right, so we have some um, risk-based kind of allocation. So risk-based allocation means that you are allocating assets based on various risks. And then there are risks like credit risk, so whether it's being going default, the kind of equity, what kind of like emerging markets and stuff, um, real estate, uh, real estate. So real estates are like um, more alternative kind of investment strategies um, and then absolute return. So basically uh, you want to seek alpha, right? So there's, there's some risk space, you can have a look at it. Uh, again, like I say, I, I like to give off the small frameworks to think about because yeah, it's uh, a, a case, case study kind of based question. So uh, remember that the art of re, uh, allocation, right? So uh, if you are in the, in the finance industry, you know that allocation, they, they, there's this thing, there's this term they like to use, art or science. So when you say something is art, right? It means that you need judgment, you need experience, which is why we pay like top uh, fund managers or even portfolio managers a lot of money because basically a location is an art. It's something that you need to learn, you, you, you must have the flair in it, right? When you say something is a science, it means that you can actually do it if you have the knowledge, right? So a location, yes, you have the knowledge, but if you don't have no experience, you might not be able to execute the strategy well. So they say location is an art, you know, and it's not a science, right? Uh, yeah, so this example, the role of government, economies, market, etc. right? So why is it art, right? Is that at the end of the day, remember when we, when we had this so-called side digression into things like uh, what's happening now in the market, at the end of the day, we need to have expectation. So Forming an expectation is an art, right? You need to, I guess, read enough, you know, or, or know enough in order to form an expectation. So your allocation is based on expectation uh, as well as your invest, investor uh, requirement, objective, etc. And therefore, uh, allocation is an art. Uh, so uh, winner, be a winner with discipline. So what does this mean is that you do not go into assets that are uh, um, that are hot or not hot or no longer hot. For example, one period of time, I think there's this stock GameStop, which was crazy but that was a while back, I think two years ago, GameStop and also are you going something that's very hot now or are you going to a trendy stuff? Um, um, and yeah, so be disciplined. Basically, what I want to say here is IPS, right? So whenever, um, uh, question comes out uh, on IPS always room, uh, sorry on, on uh, asset location always go back to IPS whether are you following the IPS right yes uh, you might be getting higher returns but is the return higher than IPS and if it is it's bad thing right because we are taking more risk so always fall back to IPS whenever you're unsure okay um I think we have a question on Tesla. I, uh, it's a hot stock, right? It, it's trendy. But at the same time, if you think about it, if EV is the way to go, then if your investment horizon is long enough, Tesla might be a good option, right? But that's if your investment horizon is long. So we're not talking about one year or two years if you're doing like five or, or ten years right because i think ev is going to take a while to catch up um a lot of even in singapore right we don't have so many evs yet uh only in america there's a lot of evs but outside the us canada evs are still a bit rare yeah now in singapore the laws are starting to be in place but then you need infrastructure as well so like, because I'm in Canada, right? There are a lot of charging stations along the road. But in Singapore, you still don't have that many, right? So getting an EV, yeah, might be still a bit tough. And I realized like outside of, let's say America, right? Let's say if you go to Thailand or, or even in the Europe, you don't see that many charging stations as well. So yeah, I guess if you are doing a long horizon or whole strategy, it might be good. All right. Okay. Going on to cognitive. So this I will not go.
go through because we men mentioned it. So basically, we think about cognitive. Do you have any emotional? So when 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 you say, oh, do you think EV or, or for example, um, uh, you are really into EVs, right? And then you want to buy or you always keep on recommending your, your clients to buy Tesla stocks because we are talking about Tesla, right? So this might be an emotional kind of bias, right? Because you have certain feelings towards this stock. You really love EV, right? And you're passionate about it. Um, so you must be careful about any heuristics or any biases that you have that might, uh, that might actually affect your decision choice, your investment decision choice, all right? So this is something that you need to think about. So whenever you look at um, case study, right? This is very important. So if you don't get the full marks, right? You need to always think about cognitive um, emotional aspect or psychological aspect of the investor. And I, I clearly mentioned this in the um, lecture 2A review of the case study where we talk about this uh, uh, Inger, I think Peter, Peter in the uh, case study, he, he has some cognitive kind of biases. And so you need to point those out, okay? In order to get the full marks. Uh, this example of loss aversion, we talk about this. The, the, the pain of loss is so much heavier than the uh, happiness of gaining the money, which is very common, right? We, at the end of the day, um, we might be very bullish or like we, we if, if you don't know what's bullish, it's like you, are, you have high expectation of, let's say, Tesla, right? Because you, you want to, you are very happy to get the, 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 the gains, right? But whenever you have a loss, you feel the pain a lot more than the happiness you gain, right? So there's loss aversion, right? So this is one of the heuristics or bias that you have, that you could have as well, or the investor might have. So we need to point this out. So if they have very high loss aversion, you should be more conservative, right? Maybe go into bonds, maybe do something less risky. So uh, these are just a whole list of uh, biases that you might have. Um, I, I won't really go through step by step, uh, individual ones, but what I recommend you is that, you know, just if you have the time, Google like what all this means, just understand what it means. Maybe you can write them down like at the side of the notes so that when you have a case study, you can immediately identify what are the bias that is available. So we'll talk about bias along the way because biases basically affects every single step of your IPS. Uh, so we talk about this at the start when we say about uh, drafting the IPS. Now we talk about it in asset allocation. Even next lecture, we again talk about biases, but from a market expectation perspective. So biases is always there. So whenever you tackle a um, uh, case study question, always talk about biases. So this, uh, uh, I repeat again, always talk about biases. Uh, okay, so you know, when we have bias, you know, you need to think clear, you need to make sure that you're not influenced by them and you need to, first of all, recognize that they are biased, you know, not to influence, all right? So uh, these are some questions that I like to um, leave behind to, for you all to think. Like when you allocate assets, what's your philosophy? You know, um, what are you trying to do? Are you differentiating from competitors? Uh, what's your what's your strategy? Are you going to short sell? You know, um, at the end of the day, you should have adequate uh, safety principle, adequate returns. Um, basically. If you're doing short selling, you need to make sure that you have enough capital to close your short sell positions. So these are things that you should think about um, when you construct your asset allocation. All right. Uh, I think this is the, one of the few final parts on uh, um, asset allocation. So one thing you think about, about asset allocation is human capital. So human capital is important to consider. Uh, I think one of you mentioned like, oh, like, Oh, I'm working in the finance industry. Okay, so very good you're working in the finance industry. But what it means that your human capital or your income, basically, will be very closely tied to the market. And so basically, right, when we think, when we are a portfolio manager, we need to ask the client, okay, we are working in the finance industry, meaning what? Maybe I should add, allocate more of your, your so-called wealth into a more defensive industry, for example, into uh, agriculture or into uh, powers and utility. 
simply because you know that your client is working in the finance industry. So you want to balance the risk, right? So remember last time we talked about how portfolio management will include your house, which is illiquid and usually it's excluded, so it's not so good, right? So now when we, and then later we talk about how we need to consider liabilities, right? And remember the last part is about equity. So in the balance sheet, we have asset, liability, equity. So now we need to consider equity component, which is what the owners actually own. So when we talk about equity, it's about human capital. So is your job very risky or are you in a very safe industry? Are you teaching? Are you like in education, which is like uh, iron rice bowl, right? You will, you will not lose a job because whether it's a, a recession or the economy is doing well, everyone needs education, right? Or people do go to school. So this is something to think about. So human capital, right? Um, but not only that, about the job scope, but also what's the age of your human capital, right? So is your human capital, you know, let's say, it, is it um, uh, 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 are you young or are you old? Let's, uh, there is this graph here. Let me just flip here. So as you grow older, you see that your financial capital increase, but your human capital will decrease. So when you're younger, you have more capital because you have more to contribute to the company, to the economy, etc. Um, interestingly, there's this thing, this is a typical human capital graph. So if you, you are very interested in human capital, right? You should read more about the job types. So different job types have different human capital graphs. So this is a very typical, this is a typical one, right? So if you, if any of you are interested to be in the, uh, to be a professor, let's say you want to do your PhD or whatever, right? Interestingly, research actually shows that the human capital graph of a professor goes up like this. So both of it goes up. So your financial capital goes up, but your human capital goes up as well. Why? So typically a professor has more um, wisdom or yeah, uh, yeah, wisdom as you grow older. You have more knowledge as you grow older because knowledge is something that... Uh, uh, grows with age, right? So what's interesting is that while this is a typical graph, if you, if the if the your the, the case study shows say that person is a professor or what, interestingly your human capitals go up as your age increase. So this uh you need to consider job as what kind of job in terms of the human capital. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh yeah you should consider the job not only the age. Right. Uh, okay, so we have covered more or less of this. Okay, so there's this uh, example of how you calculate, uh, how you balance your human capital and financial capital. So you have this question, uh, William. Okay, so he has a target allocation of 60-40. You know, he has a financial and human capital. So what you notice that both the, uh, sorry, sorry. Both, when we add up, this right, they all equals to 2.2 million, right? So it shows that uh, the total financial human capital is the same for all ages. That's what's important to take note of. Now, having seen this, you notice that the financial capital increase with age and the human capital decrease with age, right? Uh, assuming that he has uh, human capital is approximately risk free, determine the optimal asset allocation. Uh, at the various age. And remember, he wants a 60-40, okay? So total wealth remains the same because your human and financial capital add up is all the same. The optimal dollar of uh, investment um, is how much? So remember, he wants how much in stocks? He wants uh, stocks of 60%. So you know that you need this amount in stocks. And remember, hum your human capital is your risk-free, which is like your, I guess, your bonds, right? So at age 30 to 50, okay, uh, what is his financial capital? Let's look. His financial capital is this. It means what? It means that he should invest all his financial capital into stocks because his optimal is actually this, but your financial capital is less, is less than your amount you need to invest in stocks. Because this is the amount you need in stocks, right? But your financial capital is less. Means what? At age 30, 50, 100% of his capital should be invested in stocks. 
of course it's not enough so we notice that at the end of the day your, your stock allocation for 30 is only 4.55 percent and your stock allocation when you're 50 is only 40.9 percent right um and that's fine because that's the amount of money you have now but at age 65 you know that you can actually invest the full amount in stocks because now at age 65 let's look how much he has at age 65 you have 2 million of financial capital. So you know that now we only want to invest um, this amount in stocks, which is your uh, targeted allocation, and then the rest will be in bonds now. All right. Uh, okay, I believe that the your lecture slides do not have all the, this example, right? Because actually I removed this, uh, uh, this case because this case is a bit confusing. So uh, the your lecture slide should end at human capital. And actually that's all for today's lecture. So in, um, I've uploaded the slides I think twice. If you are you're holding the older slides, it will include this whole case, but don't worry about it. Uh, just ignore it now if you uh downloaded the most recent one it does not include this case so we should not look at this case because it's a bit confusing all right so we end here on human capital um now any questions regarding the, what we covered so far uh any feedback is it too fast do you understand the concepts basically what i'm trying to do is usually i try to explain the concept as simple as possible if you want like the proper way to phrase it and all you can look at the slides because those are like the way, top, right way to phrase it any questions we got your, uh i guess of tma gba any issues yeah we are done for today um so your groupings are posted group five and six had some changes because of last, last minute allocation but now it's finalized it's posted on blackboard yeah uh any questions issues concerns any <laughs> about the course um yeah we are all good yeah we're all good okay so um as usual you know uh any any questions uh regarding what we covered today we can uh, answer them next week <laughs> uh and then uh if you do have issues with your grouping let me know email me if not i think that's all for today um yeah th thanks for thanks for attending and all uh have a great friday i'm just going to start my friday now <laughs> it's 9 a.m yeah have a great friday tgif um yeah have a great weekend ahead Uh, one C. Okay, I'm not sure about one C. Uh, let me just. Okay, maybe I just quickly see what's one C. Uh. Is it very confusing? Yeah, but anyway, those that need to go uh, can leave any time now. I'm just quickly just going to look at what is this? uh so as you know like we cannot go through the tma questions um but what as it i'll go through the uh answers uh after everyone has submitted etc because i meant a few classes right um and can't go through a tma per se uh let me see whether one c uh uh <laughs> Oh, okay. So I guess one C, uh, wait, let me just, okay. So yeah, and 